Okay, the chair will call the Environment Natural Resources Policy Committee. Uh, before us, uh, we are going to have the House File 957, which Representative Detmer is going to be presenting to the committee. Um, there is an amendment. It is, I believe, in your packet. It's labeled, I believe, the DE5. It is the DE5 amendment. That's a delete all, so we'll be working off of the amendment as he presents the bill before us. Uh, for those in the audience, the DE-5 amendment will be available up where the pages are. And uh, for those who don't know, the DE-5 replaces all the language in the original bill. So with that, we're going to have uh, this. Of course, this is informational, so it's not important. The, the, we won't be declaring a quorum uh, for any purposes of actually doing business. We're going to provide 20 minutes. Uh, uh, we're going to uh, provide uh, Representative Detmer with uh, time to pr uh, present the bill. Then 20 minutes for those who are in favor, 20 minutes who oppose the bill, and then approximately 20 minutes question and answer. Now, for those who are here for to hear the wolf management uh, portion of the uh, meeting, there are people that are signed up and who have pre-signed up. There are also an opportunity to uh, sign up for additional testimony beyond the 20 that have signed up. And there's a box up there if you put your name in it. Now, how this will work is that depending on how long the original bill takes and what the members ask about the WOLF program and what have you, we'll hear from those 20 people. And if there's additional time left in three-minute increments, then we'll draw from the hat and you can testify. If not, there won't be anybody drawn from the hat or from the box, I should say, uh, to testify. So with that, uh, Representative Detmer, are you? I did see you up right here. there. Right here. Okay. <laughs> Representative Detmer will bring before for informational purposes House File 957, and we're working off the D5 amendment. Uh, Representative Detmer, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. Um, this is a bill that we've been working on for uh, a little over a year, and uh, when I looked at the schedule of the committee, I saw that there was 20 minutes, so I said I better uh, have something more prepared than just going over the bill itself, but I have prepared an introduction uh, for, the, for it kind of gives you a reason why I'm going forward with this type of uh, legislation. And first of all, to the committee members, I think most of you know me. I probably carry a lot of the, the veterans' issues uh, for uh, our caucus. But I also, have, in terms of my career with, in education, I was a teacher for 34 years. And I spent a lot of time in the classroom, in a, in a school building, and also I spent a lot of time on practice fields with uh, various sports, soccer, and different activities in physical education. So I'm well aware of uh, school environments and what goes on in, in education. And one thing I wanted to just point out, I'm not going to be talking about any particular school district in, in, uh, in Minnesota. I just want to take a look at what's going on around the country with schools and uh, with this issue. Uh, first of all, public schools in our community is, are our community anchors. Uh, they are places that house and nurture the growing children. They are meeting places for our communities, sporting events, extracurricular activities, and they employ public workers and are funding and are funded by our tax dollars. Federally, the federal government holds state accountable to improve the academic achievement and heighten the school safety. So specific. Uh, provisions in Title V is it intended to provide parents with the security of knowing that their child attends a safe school and to free, and free students from those that are dangerous. However, many schools are not free of chemicals that pose invisible threats to the health of our staff and students. Increasingly, schools strap 
our staff for much needed funds for when they come to constructing of new schools and new buildings. And astonishingly, building schools on contaminated land and generally, is generally illegal. My investigation in this issue, we found that only five states around the country prohibit or restricting siting schools near hazardous or toxic waste, waste uh, sites. Only five states have anything on the books. The community groups featured in, the, in case studies showed were shocked to find that their state had no laws or regulations that prohibited a school from building on, on toxic soil. To truly protect the health of our nation's children and to halt the reckless trend, we should be calling for local and state and federal legislators to pass laws that will prohibit future schools from being built near contaminated land in their communities. In a state-by-state -state survey on the rules and regulations that apply to siting schools on contaminated property published in this report, were found only five states have policies that prohibit several uh, se severely restricted siting schools on near hazardous toxic waste sites. And nine additional states have policies prohibiting outright the siting of schools on or near the source of pollution other hazards that pose a risk for uh, children's safety. Uh, 24 states have no policies that require sponsors of new school projects to investigate the, the SS environment of the hazards of the potential of the school sites. Uh, 21 states have school siting policies that direct or suggest that school siting officials avoid siting schools on or near speci specified man-made natural environment hazards or direct school district to consider those hazards when selecting school sites. And only five, school, five states have policies that specifically require sponsors of new school projects to undertake the remediation, a cleanup measures that contaminate school sites. And then there's 20 states that have no policies of any kind affecting the siting of schools related to the environment and mental, and, uh, <coughs> mental hazards investigations that are required. The average school, this is something I wasn't aware of, the average U.S. public school is the age of the buildings in our country today is 47 years of age, the average. 40% uh, of American schools report needing $36 billion to repair or replace building features such as roofs and plumbing. Two-thirds of American schools report require $11 billion of repairs or renovating the health and safety problems such as removal of asbestos, lead and water paint materials and underground storage tanks. At the same time, the school, school show record enrollments, uh, they address this problem. Federal and state funding is being sought to provide billions of dollars to take care of these problems. Now, when considering, when constructing and renovating schools, thousands of, of schools around the country, the school boards chose to build schools on available land that is cheap and often contaminated because of, there is no restricted to, from doing so. Pressing to save money, they are often enticed by donations contaminated by property. <laughs> Seek out the cheapest land and hire the uncertified poorly trained contractors to evaluate the, the environmental risk, all posing a great danger to our children. In poor and often community, communities, children are already suffering from dispo, disproportional asthma, lead poisoning, and developing disabilities. Construction of schools and contaminated lands exaggerates that disproportionate injustice the communities face. Now, just a couple schools that have, that have had cases, not, not in Minnesota, but in Cumberland, Maine, a school board attempted to build an elementary school next to a garbage dump. And there was no laws in Maine that would make the building public schools near the contaminated land legal. And it was, but it was the hard work of the, percent of the persistence of parents that forced the school board to re retract their proposal. And then there was a school in Quincy, Massachusetts, found hard to build a new high, sc high school on an old industrial site that included very toxic materials. Again, that was turned back by the work of the parents in the community. But then there is in uh, parents in, in Province, Rhode Island, however, were not as successful as two of their buildings were built next to a dump site. And parents in uh, Houston, Texas, also lost their fight now having to, a middle school and a high school located a chain link fence away from five chemical plants, including Bayer and Goodyear. Now, just to finish up here, 
The construction of schools on clean soil that is free of chemical contamination is especially important because of the special vulnerabilities that our children have to toxic materials. Children spend many hours in the schools. They spend many hours out on the playgrounds. And I think uh, uh, looking at what has happened across the country, I'm not saying in Minnesota, that maybe we should really take a look at what's, what's happening here. And uh, that has brought me to put together the piece of legislation, House File 957. And we're on the DE5 amendment. As you can see, we've made many changes over the, the last, just last few days, weeks, and also from last year. When this bill has passed through K-12 uh, unanimously, the K-12 policy committee. And, uh, and if you take a look at the bill, basically what we're saying is after July 1, 2015, no school may be constructed on land that is located within a quarter mile of a dump site or closed landfill. And then B, it goes into, um, I put it out to 2015 allows school districts to really take a look at if they're going to be purchasing new properties, what they need to do. Um, also, if you look down at, at line 1.19, if paragraphs A and B do not apply if the soil and gas in the school has been sampled and tested by the independent contractor. Now, one thing we re are requiring is that school districts know that parents and the community have the right to know. And the getting this information out to the school district is, uh, is one of the responsibilities and one of the re requirements of this uh, piece of legislation. So we do have um, a couple people that like to speak. And uh, the first person is Larry Lanou, excuse me, is uh, Lauren Satterstrom. <clears throat> Mr. Satterstrom, if you could come forward and when you uh, come before us, if you'd uh, state your name, where you're from and who you represent, please. My name is Lauren Satterstrom. I'm from the city of Grant and I just represent the normal citizens. I'm not a part of any particular group. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead with your testimony. Uh, my name is Lawrence, Lauren Cedarstrom, and I'm a retired business education t teacher from White Bear High School, 29 years in the classroom. Now, over time, our knowledge of toxic substances has increased tremendously over the last 30 years. We didn't know 30 years ago what we know now. Science, we've gone to the moon, we've got computers. Uh, as a result, regulatory agencies are upgrading their standards to create a safer environment for us. We're not aware of things that used to cause cancers, carcinogens. Okay, here, here is the article, January 16th, in the Pioneer Press, the headline was, Plume May Return to Superfund List. Uh, until recently, the problem was largely considered solved, but the State Department of Health uh, changed the guidelines. The department slashed the allowable level of chemicals to point four parts per billion, less than one-tenth the previous allowable level. So in other words, they're becoming more aware of the things that can harm us. Uh, in my opinion, I believe that was a very wise decision. Also, most of you are aware, in the southeast area of Minneapolis, in Como, the problem with General Mills and the plume of TCE uh, that is going through there, that's traveled approximately one mile. It's, it's very difficult to contain these carcinogens. Uh, th the next important point is we have to realize our children are our future. I, like I said, I spent 29 years in the classroom helping young people. They should be as safe at school as they are at home. That's very important. The State Environmental Resource Center indicates the children are most vulnerable on three levels. First, 
and I wasn't aware of this, they, per pound, they take in more air, water, and food than adults do. The second thing is their undeveloped immune systems are not able to handle the toxins as well as adults. So get, when young people are exposed to toxins, they don't have the ability and the resiliency that adults do. That's very important. Uh, the last thing about that that this pointed out was they have a longer period of time to develop the disease, their whole lifetime. Uh, like with the uh, Aaron Brockovich was in Fridley, there were 30 girls that went to their 20th reunion and they all had the same brain cancer. What ended up coming out is she did the research and it was next to a class one dump site, the high school. There wasn't, uh, 20, 30 years ago that knowledge wasn't available. Uh, the last, one of the last things is parents have a right to know. Uh, for example, in, in the school newsletters, if they use pesticides, herbicides, they have to notify them or about uh, asbestos and air quality has to be included. Schools have to notify parents about this. So what I'm asking is we'd like you to take your consideration and pass this bill because our children are our future. Thank you for allowing me to address this group. Thank you very much, sir, for your testimony. Um, Shannon Bryant. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Ms. Bryant, if you could introduce yourself and your, the young person with you and then uh, state who you represent and uh, we'll hear your testimony. Thank you. Great. My name is Shannon Bryant, and this is my son, Howie. Uh, he's six years old. Hey, Howie, how you doing? You say hi. hi. Hanging in there? <laughs> All right. Hi. <laughs> we, li we live in Grant, Minnesota. Um, we really don't represent any organization. We're just here on behalf of our family, pretty much, and other little kids. And those are the most important people that we listen to. Ab great. Good. Um, we have, in our family, we have four uh, young children, and Howie's the oldest. <clears throat> My husband, Howard, and I moved back here from Colorado about six years ago. Uh, we specifically bought a house in a local school district for our kids' future education. Um, like many other community parents, we voted to build a new elementary school in our local district. The, we were very excited it passed that we were going to have a new school and then we started to hear some rumblings in the community about the school being built on a former toxic dump site. As a parent of young children I started to research the issue on behalf of our family. I had discussions with our local school district, city council members, <coughs> citizens in the community, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, as to this day, I still have not received any data or document that shows the site is free of contaminants and is safe for our children. My research also included a Freedom of Information Act to the Minnesota Department of Education. I sent, um, so I've sent emails, I've made several phone calls. To this day, I have received no response. I made two um, inquiries to the Minnesota Department of Education, or education Commissioner and I also received no response. My children are too important for me to take this risk. Why should my little boy Howie here have to go to school in a place where no one can show me that the site is free of contaminants? To the contrary, in my research, the only contaminant testing that was performed was in April 2011. The results showed the contaminants tested above acceptable residential levels. So I don't understand why could you not build a house on the site but they allow children to go to school here for six to eight hours a day. That doesn't seem right. We've done a great job here in Minnesota creating drug-free school zones. Why don't we create toxic-free school zones for our children? As you go off to your caucuses next week, be proud of the position you are going to currently take on this bill. And remember, this bill is for our kids. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much uh, for your testimony, and thank you for coming in and bringing Howie, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you very and, much. And maybe in a few minutes someone might call you, ask for you to come back down and answer questions. Great. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, Howie. Uh, next we would have uh, Larry Lanou from Stillwater. <coughs> and again, if you'd introduce yourself and uh, who you represent and where you're from. All right. Uh, member of the House Chair, my name is Larry Lanou, and I am from uh, Stillwater, Minnesota. And I'd, I'd like to start out by giving thanks to uh, Representative Bob Detmer, who has authored this House File 957, along with those of you in the House that have taken your time to listen to my concerns about schools near dump sites. As I've explained to many of you, I've received a phone call from my daughter that my six-year-old grandson came in contact with something that caused his white blood cells to go off the chart. My daughter was told to prepare her family that his condition may be terminal. My hope is that none of you sitting here today, along with the families and the staff members entering schools sited on or adjacent to these sites, ever have to receive that call. I can assure you that when it is your family member, you will not feel like it is a statistic nor a coincidence. For the past two years, I have the privilege of working with Aaron Brockovich and Bob Bowcox. Their major issues have always been, number one, prevent exposure to cancerous environments whenever possible. Number two, create an awareness of the hidden dangers once determined that a risk of human health may exist. And then number three, offering the opportunity for early detection that comes with the knowledge of one's surroundings. They are pleased that this bill addresses all three of these issues. That is why they have offered to take the time from their many requests, not only from our country, but from countries around the world to work on this bill. As they have stated, why chance it? I am pleased to tell you that with prevention, awareness, early detection, and proper care, we can have a success story. It is a parent's right to know about the potential risk associated with schools cited on lands that exceed residential standards. If you read the evidence shown the documents uh, presented before you, there can only be one logical conclusion. Please move this forward, bill forward in the House. And once again, I want to thank you for your support. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And again, it may be that when we have some discussion here between Representative Detmer and the members, that it's possible we might ask you to come back up. So thank you. Yep, thank you. So now we'll go to uh, Mark Larson from the Montemedi School uh, Public Schools. Yes, sir. Welcome to the Environment Committee, and if you'll state your name and same drill as before, sir. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Mark Larson. I'm the superintendent of Montemedi Public Schools. I uh, wanted to speak a little bit about some of the issues that we go through when before we build a school. For example, in our particular case, in Montemedi's case, we started out by looking at the land that we wanted to purchase, and that was started out by looking all over the area. And we started in 19, uh, the 1950s to 1970s, there was a 10 acre that was a mixed municipal dump area. That was part of where the school district was on. We bought about 70 acres during that time. We did multiple investigations and cleanups by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and also the previous property owners. There are things called the VRAP, which is the Voluntary Response Action Plan that we did. We voluntarily did that. There's also a what you might see in the literature is a VIC. That's a Voluntary Investigation and Cleanup. Montemedi Schools participated in all of those. In 2002, Phase 1 investigation at the request of the school district was conducted by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And the report indicated the potential exists for surface water and groundwater impacts and contact of exposed wastes. And so what we did in 2002, we hired Landmark to conduct a Phase 2 investigation. And there are six areas of soil contamination or hot spots. And then the school district and the city of Grant applied for a competitive grant for the, from the EPA, but the funding was not awarded, but the school district went ahead nonetheless. We went ahead because we had the Voluntary Response Action Plan on behalf of the school district, um, which found that there were these things. There was removal of six hot spots, placement of a minimum of two-foot cover on 10-acre acre disposal area, fi filling, filing excuse me, an environmental covenant with the property restricting the land use. Then the VRAP was implemented. Um, 557 tons of soil was removed 
And I'm not exactly sure how much that is. I know about how much a shovel full is, but I'm guessing 557 tons is a significant amount. And that was replaced with fresh soil. So the school was built on all of those places, um, completely safe. The dump, the school is um, 600 feet away from the dump. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency recommends 200, and so we're way beyond that. All of our information, the testing documents and all that is on our website, and it's available for anyone who wants to go there. We've gone above, over and above what's required. We've also installed a vapor barrier and venting system beneath the slab to ensure vapor intrusion is never an issue. Um, there's a policy, there's a practice in place, there's requirements from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Those things work. Uh, they work well for the students. In fact, so well in Matamida that we received a Brownscape Award for reusing land. Uh, I would entertain questions now or if, uh, if someone else. We'll uh, wait for the rest of the testifiers. Then again, we may ask you to come back up. So members, if you have a question, uh, make sure you keep track of who we're dealing, who we're talking to, and we'll call them back up. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Haberman. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ken Haberman. I'm the president of Landmark Environmental. We're a small local environmental consulting uh, company that represents a number of private, public, and nonprofit organizations. And we specialize in real estate transactions and brownfield redevelopment. One of our clients is the Matamidi School District. I'm here to go on record to say that I'm opposed to this proposed legislation. There are various reasons for that, but it's primarily because it's unnecessary. In my opinion, there are policies and procedures already adopted by the Pollution Control Agency. And I should mention that prior to being an environmental consultant, which started in 1996, I worked for the Pollution Control Agency for 16 years, and before that was a high school science teacher for four years. And during my time at the Pollution Control Agency, I had the opportunity to work in the Superfund program and supervised that program and a program that you heard from uh, Dr. Larson called the Voluntary Investigation and Cleanup Program. And that program was the outcome of legislation in 1988 when the legislature adopted new language in MERLA in state Superfund to allow folks to come forward and that's a full range, again, of parties, private, public, government, and nonprofit, to investigate voluntarily and clean up property. A number of the policies and procedures that were adopted by that program that I supervised were eventually codified into law in legislation in 1992 called the Land Recycling Act. And there's one member on the committee, Representative Eugene. Gene Wagenius, who was the sponsor of that particular legislation. And since that time, there have been thousands of properties that have been investigated and cleaned up to make sure that they are safe for the residents in single family homes, in multifamily homes, in schools, in nursing homes, in private businesses, offices, and uh, parks, and, and sort of you name it, across the entire state. And I think those particular track record that the Pollution Control Agency has set up uh, indicates that this particular legislation is already being properly addressed uh, through the programs. Eventually in 2000, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency uh, adopted essentially almost all of the policies and procedures that the Pollution Control Agency had put into uh, use, and they now have a program that also is essentially creating a process so that if anybody buys contaminated property or considers buying it, that they're going to do the proper environmental due diligence. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Well, thank you very much uh, for your comments. So members, uh, we're going to go now uh, questions and uh, uh, Representative Detmer. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. We have, I shouldn't have forgot, Representative, former Representative Dietrich. Come on down. I'm sorry, Denise. Welcome to former Representative Dietrich. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is, as mentioned before, Denise Dietrich. I am with the Minnesota School Boards Association. We represent every locally elected school board member across <clears throat> the state and have done so proudly since 1920. Uh, Representative Detmer and the School Boards Association share a common goal, and that is to ensure the health and safety of every school child in the state. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, and I speak to uh, some of the previous versions of this bill, uh, we got a new version of it about 3.30 today, and so have not totally vetted the new version, so I will be speaking to some of the old pieces that uh, were in the previous bill and try to revise some of my remarks to the new version that we've processed in the last uh, 45 minutes. But unfortunately, Representative Detmer and the School Boards Association disagree on one piece, and that is how and where uh, do you cite a new building for a new school? We feel at the Minnesota School Boards Association that it is the responsibility of locally elected school board members to determine when and where they need to locate new schools. These are major decisions, and the process is very complex. It is not an easy job. As a school board, former school board member, I know firsthand of all the components that go into and considerations that go into a site evaluation process. You need to look at the size of the property required. It needs to be centrally located for all of your students. It needs to have access to transportation, infrastructure. You need to go through soil testing, and you need to consider cost to the taxpayers. When determining a potential site, the school board members need the flexibility and the authority to evaluate all potential sites. And after all, they are the ones who are held responsible or are liable if a mistake is made. Uh, this, the bill is previously written, restricted, and you reduced the flexibility and decision making of school board members when it comes to um, assessing proposed uh, sites for schools. And so for that reason, we have, uh, we have uh, opposed previous versions of the bill. Uh, there are a couple of other reasons, more from it, the uh, scientific and research-based uh, reasons that we do not support the bill uh, as previously introduced. Uh, first of all is we believe that the, the current system works. We think that the right processes are in place and that it serves the Minnesota schools and residents very well. The MPCA's voluntary investigation and cleanup program serves our state very well. Thanks to forward-thinking people like Representative Jean Wigenius, we have a system that encourages landowners and potential landowners to clean up landfills and once again make them productive lands. This program encourages good stewardship and school districts should participate in the activity of good, schools, of, of, uh, good stewardship. Uh, what we uh, have thought with previous uh, versions of the bill, what, what this will cause is school districts just to walk away from potential sites without even exploring them. And we believe that they at least should be able to be explored and worked with the MPCA to get certified safe if it's possible. Uh, second of all is that we do not uh, support a one-size-fits-all for the whole state. Uh, currently, when a school district looks at a potential site, site they do initial soil testing. Uh, once the testing is complete, if there was any potential or if there was any contamination on the site, the school district would go to the MPCA voluntarily to remediate to the point that the MPCA could give their approval. Or they would walk away from the property. And we think that that is, um, that is a, a good system. Uh, the sampling and testing and evaluation that the MPCA does is site specific and it could, should continue to be site specific. Uh, this bill, as previously written, takes a statewide one size fits all approach with the lack of consideration of the history of the previous site, uh, the makeup of the individual site, what was, what, was on, what was dumped in that site, and the potential for cleanup. The um, other instance that we had, a, the other part of the bill that we had an issue is, with is the uh, parent notification. This, the previous bill required the school to notify all the parents of the enrolled students and staff yearly if the school was sited within one quarter mile of a dump site or a closed, or, or a closed landfill. Uh, 
when the site was cleaned up, all the health and health and safety recommendations were already were already be, had been met, and in some cases, like the Monomita School District, exceeded. Uh, there would be nothing to notify the parents of, and so the bill would this part of the bill would not be needed. Uh, the uh, the uh, MPCA has put out um, a list of schools that are in with a quarter of a mile within a, a dump or a landfill, and there are over 275 schools that fall into that category. And uh, to my surprise, as a parent, I found two of those schools on that list were schools that my three children went to for their elementary and high school experience. That uh, we had a very positive experience in our public school. And to be quite honest, if I was required to be notified every year that my that my those two schools were were within a quarter mile of a dump, that gives me a really tainted uh, tainted idea or um, perception of the school that we we actually think very fondly of. And then, ironically, then right across the street are two other schools, but they're not on the list, so those kids would not be notified. So we would have two schools on one side of the school on one side of the street being notified annually, and then across the street street, street nobody being um, notified. I think that causes a lot of confusion, and I think it causes a lot of d doubts, unnecessary doubts and fears, a lot of times. Uh, we did a quick math about um, how much, if you had to notify annually, how much that those two schools would have needed to spend while my children were in school, and we figured it out to be about $36,000, the cost of one teacher dur dur during the dur duration of my children in school. Uh, the other thing about the notification requirements is that they are not realistic. We have been uh, we have been notified several times that the information required in the bill is not available for every single site. So we would be notifying uh, required to notify information that is not readily available. Um, this uh, so the notification process, contrary to a lot of people's beliefs, is really um, an added mandate and a cost um, and a cost to school districts. Uh, once again, uh, the current system works. There is currently a uh, on the MPCA website a part of it, called, as previous mentioned, previously mentioned, a section of it called uh, "What's in My Neighborhood." Any parent, interested um, interested resident, can go on that website and figure out what is what is in their neighborhood. Uh, so, and then finally, in the bill, and this is, continues to be true, is that the bill targets only public schools. Uh, if there were a problem to be solved, it is much bigger uh, than the narrow scope of this bill. It should be. It should include other types of other types of institutions and private schools as well. Uh, we should not be restricting and targeting our public schools when they have followed the accepted procedures and solutions that our state offers them. So, in summary, a one-size-fits-all solution does not, uh, in any version of the bill, a one-size-fits-all version does not uh, serve the state well, and that we believe that our current program under the uh, BIC program does serve our students, our constituents well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich, and I think I want you to stay, if you would, please. So um, we're going to start with the question and answer portion here uh, in the next 20 minutes. Uh, if it, it, depending on how long it takes. And uh, first question is Representative Yaruso. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have some concerns about the bill as it's written. I think it's very well intentioned, um, but I'm not sure that it solves the problem it intends to solve, and in the process it, it creates the problems that we just heard described from school districts. So I've got some comments first, and then I do have a question finally at the end. Um, First of all, the, um, the mixed municipal waste um, doesn't include industrial waste, and most of the examples that were cited are, are issues that would have been caused by chemical, for example, the General Mills Chemicals um, site is an industrial waste example. Um, it also wouldn't cover ag um, dumping that might have happened in the past and there would be a lot of chemicals of concern for that. So it doesn't really hit the, the, the more nasty sources of chemicals. Uh, the quarter mile is kind of arbitrary and there was a mention of a plume um, from a news story and 
if you do have a plume of pollution, it doesn't spread out in a, a circular radius from a site by distance. It doesn't really diffuse through soil that way. If it's an air pollution hazard, it's going to travel on whatever the prevailing winds are. And if it's a, a waterborne thing, it's going to follow either surface water or groundwater. And that, that doesn't have very much to do with a quarter mile radius. You know, it'll go in one direction and not at all in the other direction in that case. Um, and, um, excuse me, I look at my notes here. Uh, I checked, and maybe I'm just missing it, but uh, the use of the, the PCA list is a, is a great idea. But again, it doesn't really get at the bad hazards, which are the ones we don't know about. And that General Mills chemical site was not on that list. So I think it's targeting the wrong sites. I think it's got an arbitrary radius, and I think it doesn't really pay attention to how pollutants actually travel. So my question, finally, can you give us an example from Minnesota of a school that cons was constructed near but not on a former dump site that has been shown by sampling to have contamination? Mr. Chair and Rep. said, no, I, I can't give an example of a school I was looking at what's going on around the country and what we can do here in Minnesota to prevent those types of things from happening around, that are happening around the country. Representative Urizo. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Representative Benson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, um, uh, Representative Detmer, uh, Detmer and uh, Dietrich, you know, I, I was uh, listening to uh, uh, this testimony, and you mentioned that there are 275 schools that are within the uh, quarter mile uh, radius, and I'm just wondering um, um, why your uh, bill does not uh, take into consideration those. Uh, do you plan in the future uh, to introduce legislation uh, to uh, do amelioration or something uh, with all these existing schools? Representative Detmer. The qu your question was, Mr. Chair, Representative, the question was, do I plan on changing the distance? Well, I just wonder, my, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my uh, question had to do with these uh, existing schools, and um, I'm just interested in, as to why uh, your legislation does not uh, take into consideration uh, these uh, 275 schools that have been identified as being within uh, the four, one quarter mile uh, of a uh, hazardous dump or a chemical dump or whatever. And uh, wh do you plan to, uh, why did you uh, exclude existing schools, and it seems that you're uh, concerned with uh, the siting of new schools, but we, it looks like we already have uh, lots of schools that are, um, in a sense, in violation of uh, the proposal you're suggesting for new construction. Or am I missing something? Well, if you take a look at the language, uh, number one, we're looking at residential standards and uh, and two, that this legislation does not eliminate local control. Uh, that, that if you look at the, the new language, I don't know if you've read the new language, but it does uh, allow local control and it does not restrict. If you go through the bill, there are paragraphs A and B do not apply if the schools have already done this work ahead of time before building those buildings. And. Um, and it also includes uh, charter schools, not just uh, your normal public schools. So. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, well, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I guess uh, uh, I'm not making myself clear probably, but I'm just, uh, uh, are these 275 uh, schools that have been identified as close to uh, these uh, waste sites, contaminated sites, uh, have, can I then assume from what you said that all 275 uh, have been ameliorated, that uh, they no longer um, would be uh, within this uh, quarter mile of uh, a contaminated uh, site, the ones that already exist? Is that what yes. you're suggesting? Mr. Chair, I think it's a little more clear now. The PCA, when I spoke with the PCA, uh, the number I got was like uh, 100 buildings, 100 buildings. 
And uh, so that number somehow has gone up to 275. But anyway, um, they would uh, they would fall within this legislation. And basically what they would need to do is just send out their report. Their, their, uh, when they send out their report to the, uh, the community or on their website, that they are within that distance. And if they meet, if they meet paragraphs A and B, they wouldn't even have to send out the report. So. Okay. Uh, well, Mr. Yes, well, Mr. Chairman, just on another uh, item having to do with uh, the notifi notification. Uh, do you still have uh, the notification or certified mail proposal or requirement? Representative no. uh, Mr. Chair, no, it's, uh, let me just go through the language. You should have the language in front of you. Uh, beginning the 2015 school year, a school located within one quarter mile of the dump site or closed landfill must annually provide a written notice regular mail. by regular mail okay. no later than 60 days prior to the school year to parents of all, of all students enrolled in the school and all employees who work in the school that states that the school is located one quarter mile of the dump site or closed landfill. And this okay. notice also would include a map to show the, the proximity of the, of the school to the, to the dump site. And they would also place it on their website. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, then just a follow up. It, you know, to me, um, uh, Representative Dipner and I have both been interested in unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm relieved to see that we're not having to do a certified mail, mm -hmm. uh, but we still have an unfunded mandate here, do we not, uh, Representative? And if that is the case, are you going to propose now or in the future uh, funding? Uh, for school districts so that they are not impacted again. All of us here in the legislature have wonderful ideas of what everyone else should be doing, but rarely do we ever send the money along uh, to have them do it. So uh, can I assume, uh, Representative, that you will propose uh, uh, funding uh, for school districts so they can carry on this Mr. Chair, communication? Mr. Chair, that, that might be a yes or no answer. Mr. Chair, yes or no, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think uh, there's several mailings that go out uh, the beginning of the school year, or in this case, 60 days prior to the school year, and uh, I think school districts would find a way to make that work. Uh, well, they always know, do. And, and putting that on the website, I don't think that would cost the school districts any money. Okay, Representative Genius. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When we do our best work, we are in a problem-solving uh, frame of mind, and so. I'm going to back up here and look at this from a more of a problem solving. And the problem, of course, is if a site was not cleaned up the way it should have been, that there may be things wandering uh, air, wandering through the soil up into the school building. Um, and we don't know. So there is obviously, we could test the air in the school. And so I'll ask the School Boards Association, uh, do we regularly test the air quality in our schools? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Wiginius, I don't know. I don't know that for a fact that we do. I think that if, uh, I know in, in some instances there have been parents that have come forward and asked for that level of testing, and they've done it in certain schools, but I don't think they do it on a on an annual basis or anything. Representative Wiginius. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, perhaps this is a, a, an approach we should take where we could come together and say, uh, we don't know about some of these areas. Uh, these schools are already built. Uh, instead of just letting folks know that this was a former problem, why don't we let folks know what the air quality in the school is like? There might be a problem, and there might not be a problem. And if there is a problem, you can put great filters in a school. And I will tell you, members, uh, in my district, uh, I have a lot of airplane noise and a lot of airplane pollutants. And a long time ago, the MAC um, went to one of my schools, which was very close to the airport, and uh, tightened it up for noise. And when they tightened it up for noise, uh, it was so tight 
that uh, they had to put a filtering system in the school. Well, that did two things. I mean, the noise was gone, but now the school is uh, insulated. Their heating bills are nothing. But even more importantly, when I visited the uh, boi a woman who ran the boilers, she said, our absentee rate is almost nothing because we change the filters every, and I can't remember how often she was saying, we change the filters. This is a very healthy place for kids to be. So our outcome that we want is healthy kids. So should we be talking about, as a first step, checking the air in each of these schools to see if things are wandering through the soils? I mean, we might find radon. So the question is, I think that would be maybe the first cut of something that everybody could agree to. So I'd like to hear from the School Boards Association if that would be an acceptable thing. Mrs. Dietrich. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, anything that uh, we would that we would recommend would have to be would have to be funded. Um, I don't know that I would that we would recommend a statewide mandate that every school have to be have to be tested, air tested, uh, depending, you know, I think there's a lot of variables. When would be the last time you've had some level of testing done? Uh, are there any, um, are there any dangers close to the school? Are there any reasons to suspect uh, air quality uh, contamination? Uh, I think there are just a lot of variables at, that the school boards association would probably say that would, um, that would need to be, you know, first of all, answered. And then second of all, uh, if, if you ever went to some level of, of uh, testing like that, that it would need to be funded. Representative Buginius, follow-up. That's a, a fascinating response. Uh, it seems to me that it would be fairly easy to develop some criteria of, of which schools might be in a situation if they were close to a dump or on a dump or or whatever, uh, but then for the school board <coughs> association to say our kids aren't really that important, we just have to have funding before we do anything, does not sit well with me. I rather think the kids are the most important. Okay, uh, uh, Representative Bugle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering if uh, uh, Mr. Haberman from Landmark is still here. York, could you please come forward? <clears throat> Welcome, if you state your name again so we have you on the tape. Uh, my name is Ken Haberman. Uh, Mr. Haberman, um, I guess I do have a few questions. Um, you testified that you would be opposed to this bill. Um, now, your, your, your company uh, is regularly engaged in environmental testing tier one, tier two type uh, ASTM procedures uh, for this groundwater and in situations like this, is that right? That's correct. Now, um, in your professional business, uh, when a school district or any business decides to build, uh, they need uh, your services for a tier one at least before a bank or a, a, a bonding house or whatever would uh, even consider uh, lending money on something like this? That's okay, correct. Yeah, I, I, and typically now um, a tier one, cost-wise, fairly minimal. Yeah, and, and in our industry, it's called a phase one environmental site assessment and uh, that's relatively inexpensive. Um, $1,800, $2,000 or so? Although it, it really depends on... Go ahead. It, it depends on the complexity of the property, the size of the property. There are phase one environmental site assessments that are done for uh, $50,000. But Quite a few of them are around two thousand, three thousand dollars. Yes, representative. Representative Bugle, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, with this particular site uh, and this particular uh, um, project for the school, um, you went through all of these procedures. Is that correct, Mr. Hey, Chair? Members of the committee, yes, I did. Mr. Chair. 
Uh, uh, would it be would it be true to say that uh, in regularly accepted building practices today, uh, with your company and the way that uh, things are financed and things, that uh, this is already being taken care of in the marketplace? Chairman, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, that's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Representative Detmer, I appreciate you've been, you're on DE5, so that means you've been polishing the bill, and I've got a couple of suggestions for polishing it a little more. Um, kind of following up on Representative Benson, I think um, there's some definitional challenges about who's what, um, and you've got the prohibition for future construction and then you have the notification kind of as an A and then a B mm -hmm. so they flow from each other rather than two separate points and it talks about the school um, but not differ differentiating between a school and a school district and who's responsible and I, I look at uh, the school districts in my district they may have multiple schools that are located within the school district so one suggestion, maybe it make, maybe it's just me, but to make it clearer in who's responsible for what. If it's a school, the elementary school or the high school or the school where it's located or the school district is responsible. That might make it a little clearer and, and help define things better. And then on the notification for that, I mean, I think um, we have the website, uh, but we get a, a paper booklet or calendar each year that has that's mailed out to everybody but I think we can also sign up for electronic notification and uh, like with the school closures today we got we everybody received a a, uh, a phone notification I think there may be schools that have a Twitter notification so and I think elsewhere in state government we've we've moved away from requiring mail uh, requiring it and providing alternative modes of communication if desired so there might be places elsewhere in statute that that you could fit into um, the notification if you wanted to make it to reduce cost and look at precedent that we've used elsewhere so those are just a couple of suggestions on maybe how it can become a little clearer okay thank, and thank Rep you Representative thank Detmer I <clears throat> I had another question um, the school district from where I went to high school was actually, I think, about a mile and a half. I mean, at the district, the school property was about a mile and a half long and about a half a mile wide. And on that were uh, tennis courts, a football field, practice football field, uh, baseball fields. And so when you say a school, I think it should be either explained to us or define what that means, a school. Because um, if, a, if a landfill site for uh, as an example we're a quarter of a mile away from the football field the school could be another half a mile in my instance at least from the actual landfill site and I'm kind of building on what uh, representative or former representative Dietrich said so I think maybe that is something to look at because I, I mean I don't think I don't think you want football fields built on top of this in, in case of your bill mm -hmm. but where how do we measure that and how do we figure all of that out yeah mr. chair uh, line two 2.19, it just says uh, public school is defined, or excuse me, 2.18. School means buildings, playgrounds, athletic fields used by the students. Uh, that's how I defined it. All right. And I see Representative Dietrich, former Representative Dietrich came up to the table again. Representative Dietrich, did you have something to add? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do. Uh, somebody, uh, some kind person just uh, in the audience brought this uh, document to me. Uh, it is... Uh, in regards to Representative Wigenius's uh, question, and it talks about the 1997 Omnibus Education Act required, that required school districts to develop and implement indoor air quality management plans and to monitor and improve indoor air. Uh, indoor air. So um, it goes through these guidelines, and I can send that to you, Representative Wigenius, if you're interested. Thank you. Now we're going to take one more question. We're out of time for this bill. Uh, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just uh, to Representative Waginius's point and to kind of follow up through the magic of uh, texting and so forth, uh, one of the superintendents in my district, yes, and even in the furthest corner of northwest Minnesota, we do test for air. Uh, it's required as a part of OSHA's compliance, according to that, and uh, they also require a minimum threshold of 50 CFM uh, in air exchange. 
So we are doing that. Thank you for that information. Representative Detmer, do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we uh, wind this up? Well, thank you, Chair. And I know uh, last uh, session you uh, promised that we could bring this bill forward and and uh, into your committee. And I want to thank the uh, for the questions. And uh, I do plan on uh, meeting again uh, with research and uh, making some adjustments on the on the language. But I, I really believe that. Uh, um, the, the DE5 amendment that we have right now is going in the right direction. We just need, need to tweak it a little bit, and I would like to bring it back to the committee uh, when we're in session where the committee can then take some actions on it, either to push it forward or to shove it out the door. But uh, um, this is an area that's important to me. I think if you've spent any time uh, working with children in the classroom or on athletic fields, that uh, we want to have the, the environment that we want for them so they can grow up uh, big and strong. And uh, again, thank you for uh, allowing me to come before the committee. Well, thank you, Representative Denver. All right, so it is exactly 5 o'clock according to our clock here. We are going to take a five-minute break. We're going to reconvene here at exactly five minutes after, and we will start with the DNR's testimony on the Wolf Management Plan. We'll give them just a minute to get ready.
We'll call a meeting to order again, please. I'm ready. Okay, Mr. Bacchus, we're ready for your testimony. The less you have Mr. Bogus, Mr. Stark, welcome to the committee. Uh, initially, if you'll introduce yourself and then we'll go from there. Uh, you can go ahead with your testimony. Uh, just one thing for testifiers that are coming before us after our presentation and discussion with the members, that if you have handouts that you wish to give to committee members, you need to give them to our pages mm -hmm. or to the sergeant at arms. They're located on this side of the room. Ms. Faust is right there. They will bring them up to the chair, and then we will distribute them to the members. That's during the testimony part. If you have them, you need to get to them, get them there sooner than later, so that we can get them ready to go. Welcome, Mr. Bogus, Mr. Stark. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Ed Bogus. I'm director of Fish and Wildlife for the Department of Natural Resources. Appreciate the time before the committee this evening to uh, give you an update on. Uh, wolf management under state management. Uh, I believe it was two years ago this week that uh, the federal rule delisting the Western Great Lakes uh, population of wolves uh, took effect. It was published uh, in December of 2011, took place in January, or took effect in January of 2012. Um, there's been a very long history of relationships between wolves and humans in Minnesota and different levels of government programs related to wolves. Um, you'll, you'll probably hear some of what um, we've been doing as far as wolf management um, described as persecution of wolves, but I, I just want to impress on everyone in the room that um, we've been managing wolves using scientific principles like we use for uh, all species of wildlife that we manage uh, from Minnesota statehood until the middle of the last century. Government policies actually were to try to eliminate wolves. State, state bounties were paid until the 1960s. Uh, the federal government had a wolf uh, eradication program up until the mid-1900s. Uh, but with the Endangered Species Act uh, that put wolves under federal protection in 1974, Wolves in Minnesota went from being a totally unprotected species to being a completely protected species under federal law. And the, the big difference now with state management programs from what preceded that federal delisting or federal listing is that uh, the state now has and uh, the legislature has given the DNR the authorities to manage wolves scientifically. Uh, like we do dozens of other game species. So we just want to take a few minutes to uh, bring everybody up to speed on what's happened in the two years since uh, wolves were delisted. And uh, I have with me uh, Dan Stark, who's our large carnivore specialist from Grand Rapids, who will go through some information for the committee. Uh, welcome, Mr. Stark. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. My name is Dan Stark. I'm a large carnivore specialist for the DNR, and I'm uh, responsibly, responsible primarily for implementing the state wolf management plan. <clears throat> and Director Bogus had, had mentioned kind of the background and the timeline uh, leading up to state wolf management, but in a little bit more detail, uh, the DNR started gearing up for wolf management back in 1998. Uh, at that time, all the federal cr criteria for removing protections for wolves under the Endangered Species Act had been met. Uh, the, the goal for Minnesota was initially a population of 1,251 to 1,400 wolves, and uh, we had exceeded that population goal um, since about the mid-1980s. <clears throat> so a couple of steps that led towards the development of the wolf plan was the DNR went through a pretty intensive public input process in 1998. Uh, involved stakeholder input. 
on uh, developing the wolf management uh, components. Um, in 2000 and 2001, the Minnesota legislature um, had passed a wolf management bill and uh, the DNR adopted the wolf management plan based on that in 2001. Uh, a couple of the steps towards delisting or removing protections for wolves under the Endangered Species Act started back in 2003 when they had initially proposed uh, reclassifying the status of wolves in the, the northeastern U.S. Um, that was rejected based on some lawsuits. Uh, wolves were finally removed from the Federal Endangered Species Act in uh, 2007 and the state uh, initiated wolf management under the wolf plan at that time. Um, 18 months later, wolves were put back on the endangered species list. And then they were removed again in 2009. Two months later, they were put back on the endangered species list. And then uh, um, in 2011, the legislature had uh, uh, amended the wolf management bill that they had passed in 2000 that originally had included a five-year waiting period and removed that five-year waiting period for the DNR to initiate a season. Um, as Director Boggess mentioned in January 2012, uh, protections for wolves under the Endangered Species Act were removed and uh, the authority to manage wolves uh, reverted to state and tribal authorities in the state of Minnesota. Um, and I just want to mention there's still uh, ongoing litigation challenging that uh, removal of, of uh, the wolves from the Endangered Species Act. Um, <clears throat> the DNR conducted a, a comprehensive wolf population survey last winter. And these have been done at periodic intervals, initially every 10 years starting in 1978 and uh, more recently done every five years starting in, uh, um, since 1998. And there's two components to this population survey. The first part is to estimate the wolf distribution and the total range as well as the occupied range. So uh, this map illustrates observations of wolves based on uh, surveys of natural resource staff throughout the state and uh, we had over 2,700 observations, either sign of wolves, tracks, um, observations of wolves. And basically what this does is it gives us or provides us a course distribution of where wolves occur in the state. Based on townships, um, we identify the occupied <coughs> range and that's based on either where there's an observation or based on a minimum road density and a human population density that we would expect to observe wolves but maybe wasn't surveyed we also include that in the, in the occupied wolf range. It includes about 70,000 square kilometers or 25,000 square miles in northern Minnesota. In addition to estimating occupied range, we also radio collar wolves so that we can uh, get average the average number of wolves in each pack and the average territory <laughs> size. And so we use this information on average pack size and average territory size to model uh, the number of wolves and come up with our population estimate. So each of these polygons represents an indiv individual pack that was radio collared and tracked throughout the winter months to, to estimate their home range or their territory size. And then we fly over those wolves and count the number of wolves in each pack to come up with the average pack size. I keep pushing the wrong button. Um, and through that approach, we get a population estimate. And this started in 1978. Initially, the, the red shaded area um, was estimated to be about 1,235 wolves. By 1989, that population had expanded into the blue shaded area and was estimated about 1,520 wolves. By 1998, the population had expanded again into the green shaded area. And uh, we had, had three estimates from 1998 to 2008. Um, and really, there was no change in the distribution. The number did, did change a little bit between those surveys. Initially, about 2,500 wolves up to 3,000 wolves. The most recent estimate 
in uh, winter 2012 and 13, which was this past winter. Uh, but we did see a slight range expansion. Uh, we had more observations of wolves to the, to the west and south from what we had seen in, in uh, previous surveys. It didn't change the, the occupied range, the area within that total distribution all that much. Um, but the population estimate was lower than what we had previously seen. There were 2,211 wolves estimated in uh, last winter. Um, we are going to continue to do annual estimates based on radio collared wolves. So the portion of the survey that we, we radio collar wolves and estimate average pack size and average territory size, we're going to do that annually um, for the next few years to, to monitor changes <laughs> in, in uh, pack size and territory size in relation to hunting and trapping as well as changes in deer density. Um, and other factors that might influence uh, wolf population dynamics. And I think um, this figure uh, is based on research that was done throughout North America and looked at wolf population size in relation to prey density. And there's a very strong correlation to the amount of available prey and the, the number of wolves that a, a landscape can support. And this is also another method that's been used to estimate uh, wolf <laughs> population sizes. And if you used this figure to estimate the number of wolves in Minnesota from uh, 2008 to, to last winter, it would predict 500 fewer wolves. And so I think this is one of the influences on why we have a smaller population estimate than what we saw um, earlier in, in 2008. An important component of wolf management in Minnesota is, is livestock depredation management where we have conflicts with wolves and livestock, livestock and, as well as pets. And uh, since January 2012, uh, this program falls under um, the DNR and we've implemented a program that's uh, consistent with what was in place under the Endangered Species Act that allowed the removal of wolves that were verified to be, uh, or removal of wolves at, at locations where there was a verified depredation of livestock and pets. And in 2012, um, we had the highest number of wolves trapped and removed for depredation conflicts that, uh, that has occurred in Minnesota since this program um, started even back in 1978. And that was a total number of uh, 295 wolves, but one thing I want to point out is that uh, the wolves trapped where there was a verified complaint, which is equivalent of what occurred prior to wolves being removed from the endangered species list. Um, that number was 262. In addition to that, wolves can be trapped in a portion of the state that's uh, part of our wolf management zone B. Um, if a person has had a depredation in the last five years, they can ask the, the DNR to open a control area. And under that situation, 17 wolves were trapped in 2012. And then in addition, a person can shoot a wolf legally to protect livestock or pets, and if there's an immediate threat to those animals, and there are 16 wolves legally shot. In 2013, uh, it's, it's uh, quite a difference between the number of uh, wolves that were moved for depredation control compared to 2012. Uh, we had a total of seven, 70 complaints verified um, compared to previous years, that's averaged over 100. Um, we've had 110 wolves trapped where there are verified complaints, four trapped in zone B, and then another provision <coughs> under state management where individuals can employ a, a state certified trapper directly. They do not have to have a, a depredation. Um, this didn't occur in 2012, but in 2013, there were 13 wolves trapped under that situation and eight wolves shot legally to protect livestock or pets. So a total uh, in regards to depredation control for 2013, we had 127 wolves removed. Um, in regards to depredations, this, this, uh, this level of uh, depredation conflicts and wolves trapped is, 
has probably not been observed since about the early 1990s. And so it's quite a bit lower than it's been in, in recent years. Um, one explanation could be that we had an extended winter um, last year. Um, there has been some correlation between winter severity and uh, depredation conflicts. So when we have a, a severe winter, uh, typically the following summer we see fewer depredation conflicts. When we have a mild winter, we typically see higher depredation conflicts. There's been a, a wolf compensation <clears throat> Uh, program in place through the Minnesota Department of Agriculture since the late 1970s. Uh, this program has averaged uh, about $100,000 in claims over the last five years. Uh, last year was $113,000. And um, it, this is based on the fiscal year, so we don't have information yet uh, through um, for fiscal year 14. A brief summary on, on the the 2012 and 2013 wolf season. Um, for both seasons, we, or for both, for the wolf season, we have a, a application process that somebody needs to apply in order to, to, to get a license. In 2012, we had 25,000 people apply for about 6,000 licenses, and in 2013, we had about 13,000 people apply for 3,300 licenses. Um, the total number of licenses sold in 2012, we had 6,123, and that reflects where an individual that's recently been discharged from the military or is on leave can buy a license. So those people aren't included in the lottery drawing. They can buy a license without being selected in the lottery. Um, in 2013, we had 3,434. Um, <coughs> the the wolf season uh, harvest targets, which we established in order to, to close the season when we are at or approaching those numbers for 2012 was set at 400. Um, and we took a total of 413 wolves. And in 2013, there were 220 wolves uh, established as a target harvest and 237 were taken. <clears throat> There's additional information in those slides, too, about success rates and season length that if, if you have any questions about, we could discuss. A couple of the things that we're trying to gather information to help in, uh, inform us on uh, population trends uh, that we're collecting from wolves that are, are taken during the hunting seasons. We have information available from 2012 that we collected. Uh, this information for the 2013 season won't be available till later this year. Um, but looking at the reproductive status of wolves, this might help provide us some insight into, you know, what wolves are being taken and how that might influence population dynamics. And um, from the first season, about 30% of the females that were, were taken by hunters and trappers had uh, been pregnant uh, the previous year. And we basically identify that by looking at uh, the reproductive tract. So we can look at placental scars that would indicate that there was a, 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 um, a pup that spring. Um, this ranged from 2 to 11, but averaged about 6, uh, an average of about 6 um, for uh, litter size. So a total. Um, the total number of samples we looked at was 185 uh, females that were taken, and about 30% of those were pregnant. And then looking at the age of wolves that were taken during the season, 50% uh, were two years of age or less. And, um, you know, those are the, it's somewhat expected that that's the highest proportion of, of, of uh, the age class of wolves that's going to be found out there. Um, survival rates for wolves are relatively low, and um, they're the highest proportion of the population. Uh, I don't have a slide that illustrates the combination of age and litter size, but uh, there's a distinction between um, females that are pregnant uh, three and under or, or four and older, 
And it basically goes from an average litter size of about three to an average litter size of about six. And so the most productive females in the population um, is, is four and older, and we had relatively few of those animals taking during the season. It would, it would represent about 13% of the harvest and about 2% of the overall population are, are female uh, breeders. And I guess just to wrap it up, this, this was a, a goal of the Minnesota Wolf Plan is to ensure the long-term survival of the wolf and to resolving conflicts between wolves and people. And the DNR is in a good position, I think, to continue monitoring the population and evaluate uh, population trends and make adjustments to season status as well as the, the management of wolves in, in Minnesota and continue to monitor the population um, as we move forward. Representative Isaacson. Oh, okay. Representative Hackford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could you uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about the history of the uh, depredation management and uh, and, and the damage uh, account uh, for the compensation? Where we were before <laughs> wolf hunting season and tra the, the wolf tra hunting and trapping season was. Uh, the federal money that uh, we no longer get for wolf depredation and uh, trapping and those kinds of things. Can you give us a little bit of history about where we were, what happened, and where we're at now as far as that's concerned? Uh, the the uh, depredation Scott. management, uh, where we, what we had and now what we have, and, uh, and the damage uh, account and where that money was coming from and where it's coming from now. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Hackbarth, the, the previous wolf depredation program was administered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they were permitted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to trap and remove wolves that were causing damage to livestock or pets. Uh, that was a federal program. The state did not contribute to the, that until wolves were removed from the endangered species list. Um, at the same time, at about that same time, the federal funding for that program was eliminated. Um, so when wolves were removed from the endangered species list, um, it fell on the state to implement a, a program which were, I think, essentially required to do under state law to have a depredation program in place. Um, currently, that's being funded through uh, license and application fees. Uh, in 2012, we expended about $250,000. Uh, we have a cooperative agreement with the, US, uh, the USDA Wildlife Services Program out of Grand Rapids uh, to assure that we have a, um, trappers available that can respond to depredation complaints. Uh, we also have certified 100 private trappers in the state that uh, are utilized as well. Um, and in that case, where we, where the DNR opens the control area, we pay $150 for wolves that are trapped within that, that depredation control area. The compensation program is a little bit different. That's administered through the Depart Minnesota Department of Agriculture, um, and that's a appropriation through the legislature that that uh, we don't have involvement in. And Mr. Chair and Representative Hackbarth, just to expand a little bit more on uh, Mr. Stark's uh, response there, the, uh, the, our wolf management is paid for through a wolf management account, and he mentioned the application of license fees. There's also 50 cents from uh, each deer license that goes into that account that helps to, to pay, particularly for the depredation program. Um, and as he mentioned, the compensation for damage is a program run by Department of Agriculture, and that money is general fund. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to get that information on the record uh, as long as we're having this hearing, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to add. Mr. Stark. Um, one other component of the depredation program is that uh, our enforcement division has been involved in investigating depredations and verifying claims since really the program's been in place, even under uh, federal management. And that's a, um, another component that's funded through Game and Fish dollars and other, other uh, funding sources in the DNR. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll have Representative Hansen. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Bogus and Mr. Stark. Uh, my question is on DNR data on a piece that, that you didn't present on, and that's poaching. Um, and you mentioned enforcement having a role with uh, depredation, but I'm assuming that enforcement's been involved with investigating poaching, um, illegal harvesting of, of wolves both before and after the season. Do you have any anything at your fingertips, or can you get the committee that information just in terms of numbers of uh, uh, actual numbers of wolves uh, taken illegally? And, and uh, what's a, what actions have been taken in regard to those? Mr. Bogus. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Hansen, uh, enforcement's been heavily involved in that, and that was a major component of the Wolf Plan. In fact, prior to delisting, um, our enforcement officers were the primary field officers to investigate you know, illegal um, taking of wolves, and they were referred then to the federal Government, but we do have Major Phil Meyer here who could provide some statistics from the enforcement perspective if you'd like to hear some of that right now. Go right ahead, Mr. Bogger. <laughs> Welcome to the committee and introduce yourself. We obviously could see your Department of Natural Resources Enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, my name is Phil Meyer. I'm the operations manager for the DNR Enforcement. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, so I think you may have heard my question. A number of wolves taken illegally both before and after the season uh, per year. Do you have that data? And then what enforcement actions are taken when there's a, an investigation that determines that a wolf was taken illegally? Mr. Chair, um, I have two years of data that, uh, that we have taken from but um, 2012, which both seasons and the entire year, and then also for fiscal year 13 or this year. And I can um, illegally taken wolves, we've had six cases in uh, 2012, and for this current year, we've had a none. No illegal wolves that uh, have been prosecuted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And of the Six cases in twelve. What happens? What happens with the penalty? What's the penalty for that? Mr. Meyer, I I don't have the penalty amounts right at my fingertips. Um, some cases could be sent in through a long form complaint, and other cases could be tab charged. And I, I'm sorry, I do not have those numbers, but I can get them for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the. And if it's possible to get the information before the seasons occurred, just in what the the actual illegal take is, and um, if there's any <coughs> estimated take of uh, of poached wolves, uh, and my reason for asking this, I think one of the things when the wolf uh, season was established is we lowered the restitution value. So under the game and fish laws, you could you have a variety of enforcement tools. Um, that are there, you could take the the firearm, or if there's a law broken, you could take the firearm, you could deny hunting privileges. So that's part of what I'm wondering is what happened to those cases. Now that there is a season, what happened? What happens when someone breaks the law and takes a wolf illegally? Um, as a legislature, we lowered the restitution value from, I believe, 2000 to $500 per wolf when uh, the season was established. Um, and part of what I'm trying to do here is look at the data on, I, I don't see any way we should be um, soft on illegal taking of wolves if we have a season. And trying to get data and information about what's happening before and after the season came on and what the enforcement actions are uh, what the tools are and what the consequences are if someone is illegally taking away. Okay. Representative Pavia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of questions. Last spring, Mr. Stark, we were presented in committee <clears throat> some information after wolves, uh, excuse me, after moose had been radio collared shortly after the commissioner announced that they would no longer be a moose hunting season. Um, that radio collaring continued through the calving season. 
and uh, and they placed those radio collars on calves. Uh, can you repeat for me or for us the, some of the statistics about the wolves and the impact that they had on on those radio collared moose? Mr. Stark. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, I, I don't have those statistics or that data available right now. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Will you get that for us, please? Yes. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Bogus, did you have something you'd like to add to the first Fabian? Uh, I, I have some of the information, Mr. Chair, that Representative Fabian was asking about that I just received, actually, uh, an update on the wolf, on the calf project, which is one phase of the moose research project, um, and indicates today we've documented nine capture-related abandonments, two capture-related mortalities, four slip collars, one drop collar, one natural abandonment, one abandonment of unknown cause, one drowning, one unknown predator kill, four bear kills, and 16 wolf or possible wolf kills, and one wolf injury with secondary lethal infection. So after censoring out the capture-related things, which really were um, related to marking the calves, um, 25 of the 33 calves that were collared have died. Of those, 22 were preyed upon. So 22 of the 20, 25 of 33 have died, um, 22 due to predation. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Then I, um, you, you mentioned in the test or in your statements uh, uh, something about wolves being monitored. Uh, can you clarify for me how you're monitoring with radio collars or some sort of electronic devices or whatever? <coughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Sorry. Fabian, um, uh, radio co we're using radio collars to estimate pack size or estimate territory size and, and pack size. And so we do that using GPS collars that essentially have a GPS device in the, in the collar that takes a location and stores it in the collar and we can retrieve the data. Um, we also do flights to locate the wolves and, and then we can plot their location and and count the number of wolves in the pack. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And how many of those do you have in the field? How many of the GPS callers and so forth do you have in the field? Mr. Stark. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, currently there, there are about 55 wolves that are radio collared through the DNR and other agencies, including um, the USGS, which is Dave Meach's study up in the northeastern part of the state, um, some uh, um, tribal bands uh, that are doing wolf research, um, the DNR and uh, uh, Voyagers Park um, would be uh, some of the agencies that are included in that. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Final question. Can you explain then how you also coordinate your activities with U.S. Fish and Wildlife? And if your counts that you take, does U.S. Fish and Wildlife do uh, population counts too, or is that strictly um, uh, DNR? Mr. Stark. Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, all the population estimates that have been done in Minnesota on a statewide basis have been conducted by the DNR, and that's the information that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has used for their population estimates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a little bit of a follow-up. You just brought up tribal governments, and I wanted to ask and either one of you, Mr. Bogus or Mr. Stark, uh, how's the, the executive order the governor put into place uh, regarding consultation with tribes? I know there was uh, some issues. Uh, uh, Leech Lake Band is in my district. Um, I heard about it. There's some issues with how the state DNR is uh, working or not with the tribal government. And how's that looking now? Are you taking steps to reach out? Uh, I want to. I want to know what's going on, and are we making the situation any better, Mr. Bogdan? Mr. Chair and Representative Purcell, yes, there is a governor's executive order on consultation. It's pretty prescriptive in terms of identifying issues and having those consultation meetings. We're in the process of doing those meetings 
right now we've solicited from all the 11 federally recognized bands or communities in the state, you know, the issues and asked to, to, to meet with them on the broad range of state or DNR and tribal issues. All the state agencies are doing the same thing under the governor's executive order. So, um, you know, we feel that um, we, we did get off to a bumpy start on that consultation. We've worked for years, I would say, very well with the tribes at a staff level, but um, with uh, some of the wolf and moose uh, developments, which happened fairly quickly, I don't think we did as good a job as we could have at that government to government level at the tribal chair and the, and the council level and, and uh, under the governor's executive order we feel like we are getting those relationships back on track. Representative Purcell. Thank you Mr. Chair and thank you Mr. Boggess. Just as you're moving forward um, please keep me apprised. I'm sure there's other representatives who would like the same thing uh, how that's going and um, I will hear about it from my constituents as well so I appreciate hearing about it from you. Uh, Representative um, Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you guys for your testimony today. I do have a couple questions for you. Uh, <clears throat> so last session, I sponsored a bill to ban the wolf hunt. And uh, while I am uh, clearly opposed to that, uh, I have to say that, you know, uh, such a complicated issue has required me to spend a significant amount of time doing some research and, and learning. Isaacson, yes. You said you're opposed to your own bill. You said you quit. Oh, I apologize. I oppose sure the wolf hunt. Thank you. Record. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm Hold starting off that awesome. Person. That's great. So, <laughs> anyways, thank you for the clarification. I oppose the uh, the wolf hunt, which is what my bill uh, thank was for doing. Thank you for getting that on the record. Uh, however. Uh, my understanding of the wolf population and the wolf management plan and the history lesson I went through in understanding how we came to the point we arrived at uh, was quite fruitful in, in helping me see a, a much bigger picture. And, um, and, and so my primary concern while I am opposed to the wolf hunt is much more and, and bigger is a, a healthy wolf population, I think. And, that, and that's something in, in meetings with Commissioner Landwehr and, and hearing you guys talk about it, it's quite clear that uh, you appear to be committed to that. And I think that's a, a very good thing. However, um, in, my, in my research and looking around, I found that I, I don't think that I accept um, this idea that we have a, a, a purely scientific method going on as the determiner of our de decisions and how we're managing the wolf population. Or if we do, we're using some ways that I know that in other areas of science wouldn't be accepted as uh, um, plausible. Uh, uh, I know that when talking with the DNR, we're talking about a wolf population plus or minus 500 wolves. So it's a thousand wolf range. Uh, I know we're looking at uh, using uh, <clears throat> um, methods that involve 90% certainty rather than 95% certainty, which is usually how the scientific method works. And so uh, I, I struggle with the idea that we're doing all we can. When I look back at the history as we evolved the wolf management plan and what it originally was in 98, what it became in 2001, and then how it was cherry-picked to bring in the wolf hunting uh, law uh, into place and the things that we are not doing that I think are significant in terms of engaging a community, not just the hunters. I think there's a mistake in understanding that your primary concern or client is the hunters, and that is not your primary concern and client. Your primary concern and client would be the people of Minnesota. And so my concern, <laughs> so my concern, okay, yep. one moment, please. So I, I can understand the excitement of uh, agreeing or disagreeing with a member. But it's not in the decorum of the House to applaud, cheer, or howl in this instance, maybe. Um, so we'll keep that at a minimum so we can continue on in the idea that we get then to listen to as many people that want to testify as possible. Representative Isaacson. And so to be clear, and I'm not soliciting applause, I'm not saying that any one person is sitting here saying, we're doing something contrary to the best interests of the wolves. What I am thinking, and through my experience, is that we have taken part of what the wolf management plan asked us to do, and we have conveniently ignored other parts, or as in conversations with people in the DNR, our hands were tied because the legislation didn't allow for that. 
to be uh, some of the tools we have in place or could have in place for managing the wolves. And, and so I have a series of questions related to the wolf management plan that I'd like you to maybe shed some light on, if you would, as we take a look at uh, what exactly are we doing. I think that what you've done and described is pretty good, uh, but I'm not sure that it covers all that we can be doing and having a clear understanding. Because for me, if I were to write a paper in my field as a social scientist and, and that, that had only 90% certainty with the give or take of a thousand wolves, I would, I would really, a thousand, I mean that kind of disparity is, is kind of unacceptable when you look at other states that have much more success getting much clearer and exact numbers even over in Wisconsin. So I really want to just ask some questions like, are we giving you everything you need? Well, Representative you, Isaacson, with the questions please. I'm getting there. Thank you. All right, thank you. So. I want to know, in the beginning, when we decided that we were going to have a wolf hunt and we were looking at the management plan as the guiding, guidepost to that, why wasn't there a baseline survey done of the wolf population? Mr. And was that ever under consideration? Mr. Boggess or Mr. Stark? Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Isaacson, uh, in addition to the wolf popula population survey that's been conducted every five years, mm -hmm. There are annual indices that we look at in regards to population mm -hmm. trends. And those indices have, have supported uh, population data in between those comprehensive surveys mm -hmm. and have tracked or, or correlated mm -hmm. or corroborated that information very well over the, over the years. Mm -hmm. And with any wildlife species, it's extremely difficult to estimate mm -hmm. population numbers. Wolves are, are one of the species in Minnesota that, that we estimate and, and do a population estimate. Others are, there are other species that, that we don't do that for. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to the confidence interval, um, you know, there's a, there's a wide range and we probably could uh, um, look at other methods that are either uh, more um, cost more and might provide us a, a, um, a tighter confidence interval, mm -hmm. but you know we have to weigh those cost benefits. Mm -hmm. And you know I, th I think our wolf population population estimate is is a valid estimate, and um, it's as good as any that's done for for any wildlife population out there on a on a scale that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Representative Isaacson. So why wasn't there a baseline wolf uh, population study done then? Mr. Stewart. I don't feel like I heard you say that we have uh, uh, indices and, and some basic stuff, but I don't hear you saying we just did a baseline understanding to know exactly where we're at right before the hunt, considering we just came off the endangered species list. It seems to me like it would even be common sense that the first thing we should do is have a really strong, clear, scientific, empirical understanding of what our numbers are. And what I hear you saying with this scientific interval that even you admit could have been better, we just chose that based on some also some indices that told us. So I want to know, was it under consideration? Was there a reason why we didn't do a baseline? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Isaacson. The timing of the wolf survey is conducted in the winter months at the, mm -hmm. at the lowest point in mm -hmm. the population um, cycle during, during a, mm -hmm. an annual cycle. Um, the wolf season was implemented before we would conduct that population survey. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially it was done post season. Mm -hmm. um, but we had confidence in those indices that mm -hmm. support uh, what we thought the population was at the time. And, and that's what's utilized to, to uh, implement um, seasons on bobcats, fisher martin, um, we use those indices to model the population and, and track population trends but without doing a population estimate ever. And so um, the information that was available was adequate um, for the DNR to implement a season. So if you would have had to have done a baseline survey, you would have had to push a hunt back a year. Would that be correct to get one adequately done? Mr. Stark. Uh, in order to do a population survey, before implementing the season, yes. Right. So my concern is, is that um, we've obtained some emails back and forth in the DNR, and one of them says, however, after giving con considerable thought over the weekend, I've come to the conclusion that we owe it to our primary clients, the hunters, the trappers, and to the livestock producers as our secondary clients to do what we can to establish a legitimate harvest now. I find that when we've talked a lot about the scientific method and how science is driving what we're doing, 
and then I read an email from the Chief Wildlife Management Section of the Division of Fish and Wildlife from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources that refers to our primary motivation. Despite having right before that said, all things being equal, I prefer a delay in the season until we establish a license, complete a population survey, and draft a population model even if we have to estimate the harvest and success initially. That that being the initial thought, but however, we owe it to our primary clients, which we've identified as the hunters and the trappers, that we should push through with the season based on what we both have kind of circled around now as saying wasn't maybe the most accurate data, right? Because if we have 90% confidence, that doesn't stand up anywhere I know of empirical science, right? Especially when you start getting into some of the hard sciences. And so I find it difficult to believe that we are truly embracing this idea of a scientific method as part of or all of the, what, what motivates us in the management plan. Mr. Uh, Representative Isaacson, I didn't hear a question in that. I heard There wasn't one, but I have one now. <laughs> Would you like to ask a question, Representative Isaacson? I enjoyed that question. <laughs> anyway, would you like to ask a further question? Yes, I would. Thank you. Thank you. In addition to that, uh, again, I understand that this may or may not have been related to specifically to where you're at, and I'm not in any way saying that you are responsible for what we're doing or aren't. I, I'm not asking that question. But I had a really great conversation with the commissioner. And in that conversation, we talked about the DNR's purview is based on what the legislation provides for them. And what our legislation provided for us in wolf management doesn't even seem to cover half of what the wolf management plan initially asked us to do. And there are several parts of that that I would list off here, including the idea of a baseline survey, right? Uh, this idea of understanding how we have uh, cost-effective non-lethal methods for, for wolf management, the um, sufficient reporting of human-caused wolf mortality. I don't know that we've had a clear understanding beyond depredation hunting. We clearly don't have an understanding of the poaching numbers yet. I've heard as high as 10 percent, 20 percent. I don't think anything scientific has been done on that. Not only that, I, I struggle to understand if we've engaged the citizens the way we intended to and the way the wolf management plan originally wanted us to and having an understanding of the relationship between human beings and wolves other than just the hunt. Let me be clear, I'm not up here saying at this moment, I'm not saying we need to ban the hunt, but what I am saying is that I don't think that the DNR has been given necessarily the tools or direction, nor has it asked for the tools or direction, to manage the wolf population in a way that guarantees the best of our ability, a successful wolf population. Because right now your numbers have it at the low point of your thousand wolf range, at the baseline of what we wanted the wolf population to be through the wolf management plan at 1600. Well, if I were to take everything you guys said today, statistically, with that kind of a range, I'd be really concerned that we have any clear understanding of what the wolf population is right now in terms of its numbers. And I, I don't doubt that we have a significant effort moving forward in trying to gain an understanding of that, but what I want to know is, do you think, in your opinion, there are things we could do, be doing more to have a better and clearer understanding of that? And, and what parts of those would be cost prohibitive or not? Mr. Stark. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Isaac, Senate. <laughs> I guess I want to clarify the question. Are you asking um, specifically in, in regards to our estimate whether or not we can improve that and how we might improve that? Mr. <clears throat> Isaacson. We'll start there, yes. Mr. Stark. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Isaacson, um, the DNR uh, initiated a pilot study a couple years ago to look at other survey methods, and um, it, it wasn't very effective, um, both at uh, observing wolves and enumerating wolves, and um, essentially it had to be scrapped. Um, and I think we'll always be looking at, at other methods that might be available for us to estimate wolf numbers um, and try to improve on, on the methodology that's used. But until we find something that either improves uh, the confidence in our estimate or is more cost effective, I don't, I don't see us changing the way we estimate wolves um, it has, has been uh, reviewed under, um, essentially it's, it's the same method that other states and agencies have used to estimate wolves in other places. Um, with the exception of where uh, Representative Isaacson mentioned, like Wisconsin, where they try to count every individual wolf. Uh, they also have um, at least 1,000 fewer wolves than us, maybe uh, 1,500 fewer. And um, they developed a program over time that, that allowed them to do that. I think for us to, 
to do that, it would it would be a little bit different trying to estimate the total number of wolves and have a, a program like that to be able to do it. Um, and, and, and Mr. Chair, if I could just Mr. Boggess. respond a little further to Representative Isaacson. Um, <clears throat> You know, we did the wolf plan in 2001. We've been to the legislature several times since then asking for uh, appropriations to implement the plan. We were anticipating delisting to occur in 2003 or so. So, so the reason we have Mr. Stark is that we got money from the legislature to fill a, a wolf position. We also have a wolf research position. We also have enforcement staff. We got appropriations to do um, uh, expanded research and monitoring. Um, in, in the field of, of wildlife science, it's biological science, it's by its nature somewhat inexact, and the commonly accepted principles of wildlife management typically use trend data, not population estimates. We don't estimate the number of deer in Minnesota when we set the deer season. We don't estimate the number of pheasants in Minnesota when we set the pheasant season. We don't estimate the number of grouse, but we do track the trends. With wolves, we're doing both. We're estimating the number and we're tracking the trends, and we have multiple ways of doing that. Um, could we do it better? Sure. If we had more money, we could do it better. We are, as uh, Mr. Stark mentioned in his presentation, we are going to start doing this population estimate on an annual basis for a few years, mm -hmm. absent uh, the, the really intensive part of that that takes a lot of effort is soliciting reports from all the the parts of the state to see if the range has expanded. We've seen very little range expansion over the last four surveys. We can do the t telemetry data on pack size, pack territory size, and do a, do a very good estimate on an annual basis. And, we'll, and we're committed to doing that. We're working on one right now for this year. So it's always going to be somewhat inexact, but it is based on um, peer-reviewed published science. Representative Isaacson. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> about how many wolves would you say were killed in the first two seasons total? Mr. Stark. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Isaacson, there were a total of 650 wolves that were legally harvested okay. and registered through our, our season. And does that, and, and, Representative Isaacson. Thank you, sir. Uh, depredation and numbers with that related to the number of wolves lost? Mr. Stark. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Ison, that's, that's not including the depredation number. The depredation right. numbers are the ones that I included in that, okay. uh, in the slide. And we, Isaacson. thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and have we, we don't really have a grasp, and, and I understand the nature of it makes it difficult, but to understand exactly where poaching would, would play a role in that total number, is that correct? Mr. Stark. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Isaacson, um, in regards to poaching numbers, we don't have a direct measure of that. No. Yeah, and, and that's a fair statement. Representative Isaacson. Thank you, sir. Um, so the current wolf population we have right now is at about 2250, is that correct? According to your numbers? Mr. Chair, Representative Isaacson, yes, that's, that's the estimate from last winter. Representative Isaacson. And uh, how many of those wolves are being tracked with callers? Mr. Stark. Mr. Chair. 55, I heard. 55, yes. is that correct? I didn't catch that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit to a different direction. In terms of understanding how we, uh, the hunt affects wolves and has an impact to them, what, what, what methods or what ways are you able to understand uh, the relationship of how the hunt affects um, uh, breeding and, and, and um, the success of a pack in raising pumps, uh, uh, how many wolves are in a pack and that kind of stuff. Do we have any data on that? Or can you, if you have covered it, I apologize if I missed it. But maybe just restate that. Mr. Uh, Chair. Mr. Chair and Representative Isaacson, uh, pack dynamics have been studied in, in a lot of different areas of North America looking at wolves. Mm -hmm. And there's fairly high turnover um, in pack structure, uh, wolf age, Average wolf age uh, or survival is, is pretty young. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one piece of information that we have from the season that I, I tried to mention in the presentation was that uh, we look at breeding status of, of females that are taken by hunters and trappers and uh, estimate the percentage of, of those animals that are being harvested to try to get an idea of, you know, what the impact is on on breeding females in the population. And um, in regards to, you know, how that influences uh, wolf numbers, I, I believe it would be 
if you if you looked at those breeders that were um, uh, higher had higher uh, average litter size, it, it would be about 45 um, wolves, which uh, would equate to about 10% uh, of the packs mm -hmm. that that may have been influenced uh, or lost a breeding female from the 2012 season. So that would mean there's 300 and, or 400 other packs out there that weren't. Okay. Representative Isaacson. Thank you. Uh, so currently we're relying on the data of previous studies. We, have, we haven't looked at that. Currently you guys haven't been given the authority or asked to examine the, the result of hunting uh, or mortality rates on wolves on the pack dynamics at this point and what that might result in how the packs are successful in breeding. Mr. Stark. Mr. Chair, Representative Isaacson, we're not looking at that specifically in regards to individual packs. Mm -hmm. um, but we do radio collar packs, and we're trying to radio collar packs in the same areas each year to see how um, those packs might persist over time and get information in similar areas with similar landscape characteristics. And, um, you know, and for example, this winter we've been counting, getting pack counts, and, you know, and, and see how that changes from year to year with, with the, the season as well as what I think is another important factor uh, and has been documented through uh, a lot of different wolf research is the, the, the Mr. deer density. Mr. Stark or Mr. Boggess, uh, do you need anything from the legislator, legislature other than you talk about you could you always use more money to do things uh, that would enable you to better um, study the wolf densities of a pack and the radio, those types of things that represent Isaac, or do you already have that authority? I believe, I think I know the answer, but I want to make sure I do. Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, we have fully staffed and funded the wolf management plan, and uh, we're, we're not seeking anything further from the legislature. Thank you. Representative Isaac. Thank you. Do you know uh, when uh, a member of the pack passes on for any reason, just mortality, regardless if it's hunting or not. Uh, any idea what kind of impact that has in terms of, or does it matter which member it was of the pack, that, that whether it's the alpha or the breeder or not, in terms of the health and well-being of the pack? Mr. Stark. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Isaacson, I, you know, this has been looked at in different ways over time with different, different studies. And, um, you know, for example, here in Minnesota, they, they looked at uh, the loss of, well, not just in Minnesota, but in other places, they looked at the loss of breeder status um, in a wolf pack, and, and um, they did see some influence from that, but there is a high turnover. There are a lot of individual wolves out there in the population that quickly replace those breeding animals. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's part of the biology of wolves. We've got mm -hmm. pack structures as well as individual wolves and um, they're out there looking for a, a place where they can establish and find a mate and breed and have offspring. So um, even though we do lose some of those animals, they're quickly replaced. And in regards to having influence on, on depredations, there was really no correlation to that. You know, sure. in regards to having a higher uh, depredation um, trend as a result of sure. lo losing breeding animals. Sure. Representative Isaac. Thank you. And, and, and again, forgive me if, if this has been kind of covered, but I want to make sure I'm very clear about this. Uh, is there currently in the DNR a database uh, uh, which kind of tracks and has an understanding of, of how diseases such as mange or anything like that uh, affect the, or let's go all the way around, depredation or accidental kills or poaching, that's really tracking all of that information at one time that's easily accessible, that, and, and is there really a program in place to encourage that kind of reporting along the way? Are, are those two things in existence, and if so, how does that work? Mr. Stark. Mr. Chair and Representative Isaacson, um, uh, we do track information on, on mortality causes. You know, mm -hmm. we have a, a, a program that our conservation officers, if they investigate a depredation, they complete a form um, and submit it. Uh, if we have perhaps a road kill that somebody uh, finds or a wolf that has mange, um, some of those get recorded, but it's, it's more opportunistic. It's not a real detailed uh, accounting, and it's certainly a minimum number. It's not going to account for all the animals that are out there. Probably the best information is radio-collared wolves to look at mortality factors. 
and do a, a specific cause of uh, a study on the, on the mortality of wolves. Mm -hmm. we, did, we did do a disease study in 2010 mm -hmm. where we uh, looked at about 400 wolves that were sampled through uh, wolves that were killed by uh, depredation control um, and other wolves that were sampled for radio collaring to just assess disease prevalence. <clears throat> so we, we looked at, you know, at that time what diseases were out there that may be affecting wolves. Mm -hmm. And then we can do that periodically and look at, you know, how those uh, prevalence levels change over time. Um, and that study is, or that uh, information is currently being summarized to, to publish in an in a article, a peer-reviewed article. Okay. Representative Biden's extent. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, does the DNR have any position or efforts or any programs in place to, to look at the idea of non-lethal deterrence when it comes to uh, um, uh, wolves and, and their engagement with the human community? Mr. Sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Isaacson, uh, I, I, most of the programs that are in place are reactive to depredations that mm -hmm. have already taken place. Okay. Um, you know, if, if we're approached by individuals that have um, depredation concerns, we recommend uh, tools that might be useful, whether it's fencing or, or things mm -hmm. like that, but we don't have a source of those to provide. Um, through our contract with Wildlife Services, they do have some of those things still from, um, you know, within their uh, um, resources to provide mm -hmm. to producers. Mm -hmm. So through our agreement with them, they do some of that work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to, be clear, to be clear, though, the, there really isn't a plan in place uh, or uh, educational opportunities. There isn't a, anything set up by the DNR at this point, and maybe you haven't been asked to yet, but I want to be clear that the, it, for non-lethal uh, um, deterrence uh, of wolves in, in, for surrounding farmers and, and such. Is that correct? Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Isaacson, uh, we do have a brochure that we're working on to pro to. Uh, have some resources uh, or information basically available to livestock producers or residents in northern Minnesota that may have concerns about wolves in their area to help, you know, provide some information on what tools or resources might be available and how to react to wolves. Um, but specifically having resources like fencing or, or other things, we, we do not have that in place. And, um, you know, there was a study in Minnesota that was funded through the legislature back in the late 1990s that looked at husbandry practices in right. relation to livestock depredation trends, and they had a hard time finding anything mm -hmm. that, that really fit. They were intended to develop best management practices, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, they weren't able to find anything that, that right. really was clear for them to, to implement. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> When we're looking at the, the money appropriated by the legislature and or money uh, from the fees of uh, 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 hunting licenses, um, how are we paying for this, basically? What I want to, how are we paying for what we're doing right now with wolf management activities? Mr. Boggess. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Isaacson, right now um, it's, I believe, almost all coming out of the Game and Fish Fund, either, um, you know, we have a wolf uh, management account now that was established two years ago and that mm. money from applications, license fees, and deer licenses go into that fund. There may be a little bit out of, it's also a, a fund in the Game and Fish Fund, but um, Heritage Enhancement Account, there may be some money, I'm not sure. Um, that's from in lieu of uh, sales tax on state lottery, but it's all various accounts in the Game and Fish Fund. Representative Isaacson. Uh, and, then, and then the other piece, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, Representative yeah. Isaacson, is the compensation for damage that occurs right. as general fund through the Department of Agriculture. Okay. Uh, Representative Isaacson. Mr. Chair, uh, I think part of what is interesting to me, and, and I guess my question is, is that um, when we're looking at how we're currently paying for wolf management practices, the, you would say the entirety of the wolf management budget comes from the sources you're talking about nowhere else at this point, right? Is that correct? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Isaacson, yes. Thank you. Representative Isaacson. <coughs> I think when I, 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 believe it or not, this is uh, for the point of brevity at this point. I, I haven't gone nearly into the detail and depth that I would like to go into uh, uh, at this point. So I've hit, uh, I've hit on some kind of some basic points we've talked about, trying to illustrate to me what I think is, is significant in terms of what we've done so far and what I think further needs to be done. And I think we've hit on, just in our conversation here, which is a portion of what I would hope to cover, but I don't want to uh, put everybody to sleep with boring statistics and numbers. But what we've talked about here is a question about whether our account management is, is accurate or as accurate as it could be, definitely compared to how other states do it and what we could be providing for a clear number of that to guarantee even from the hunter's perspective, a population that's robust from their point of view, right? And that, that would be something that I think is in the best interest from all stake, stakeholders in this situation. Second, uh, I think it's quite clear that um, uh, we don't have the kind of database necessary to give us at our fingertips the numbers we need to understand the trends that are going on in the wolf population, and I think in a way that doesn't leave us dangerously close to that number of 1,600, not only that, we haven't given you guys the tools, I think, to manage uh, uh, some of the things that I'm concerned about in tracking the mortality of wolves all around, not just with hunting, with depredation, with accidental kills, with poaching, all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and the third part that, that kind of bothers me, and, and this is part uh, uh, what I hear from many of the advocates who would rather that I stood up here and told you the hunt is should be taken out. Uh, many of the advocates that I think would rather me s talk to you straight about why we need to get rid of the hunt. Uh, but I think what they would, would also say on a, on a softer note is the idea of engaging the population and understanding this, this, this idea of, of the non-lethal deterrence and, and in general the way in which we approach the human-wolf relationship, right? I think that the, the, the commissioner said something very interesting to me when we were talking and, and he said that the only way you can go back to a state of nature is if you remove the humans and that's not going to happen, right? So what can we do now to provide the best management plan to ensure their population is, is successful uh, considering the fact that we're not going anywhere, right? And, and, and my concern with that would be is what kind of relationship do we have and how are we seeing the wolf and how are we respecting the, the, the way other viewpoints come in, tribal or not on, on the importance the wolf has to our, our society and what the, what, the, what the wolf management plan refers to as some of the important parts of that that I don't know got transferred over to the legislation that, that eventually led to this hunt. And so I feel like in our conversation there's quite a few spots you guys could use a helping hand on uh, beyond what you've been doing so far. And, and I'm not saying that the efforts you've done so far clearly we're at a number higher than we were when we were on the endangered species list. So something must be going at least somewhat right, right? But I don't think I'm convinced that in the long term we're creating a sustainable approach. And that's, that's what I want to, and that's where I'll end with that. But I, that's what I'm most concerned about. And I think you can bet you're going to see some legislation down the line here that's going to have a, a discussion. And I would encourage my friends across the aisle to engage me in that legislation to make sure that we have the tools to ensure a long-term sustainable population that isn't subject to the possibility of uh, well, get dangerously close to the idea of 1,600 uh, uh, wolves, and I'll, I'll drop it at that at this point. Well, thank you, Representative Isaac, and, and you know, <clears throat> I appreciate, appreciate all the communications you've had with myself and your passion uh, for this issue, and, uh, you know, we've been talking about this since you got elected, and, and uh, the purpose of having this hearing is to exactly understand what it is that we may be lacking or maybe doing well. Uh, we have three more people, and we will be able to accommodate, it looks as if, every testifier, including those in the box, if we wrap this up soon. Uh, we have three other members. I have a question. I, I think it will be brief. Uh, Mr. Bogus or Mr. Stark, uh, going back uh, to my youth, I remember uh, Dr. David Meach being involved in the, manage in the uh, assessment and uh, all kinds of studies and everything under the sun. And I remember when I was a kid, we flew, uh, my family flew him down over Isle Royal and all kinds of places to count wolves from the air out of International Falls. And um, I personally believe that he's the, maybe the world, but certainly our country's most foremost expert on wolf populations and all of the things that we've been asking questions about. Would that be a correct assumption, or how would you characterize his expertise in? Uh, in the wolf management and uh, assessing populations and all the things to do with uh, wolf management. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, 
Dr. Meech has been studying wolves for over 50 years. So, I mean, he has a long track record of um, studying wolves not only in Minnesota but many different parts of the world and has collaborated with a lot of wolf researchers and um, has contributed a lot to our knowledge of wolves and, and uh, you know, he is one of the foremost authorities on, on wolf research and out there. Okay, thank you for that and clarifying that. Now, so my question is, it's my second question is, uh, have you uh, discussed our wolf management plan with uh, Dr. Meech and does he have any concerns over the way that the department is presently managing the wolf after the delisting and through the hunting seasons? Um, Mr. 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 Chair, um, we have had discussions with Dr. Meech. Um, primarily, there may have been some um, since the first uh, first year if uh, Mr. Stark has more to add to this, but he he was very supportive of um, not only the wolf management plan, but of the uh, season. He, he has been of the opinion for a long time that um, in order to, for, for people and wolves to get along, that you need to have a balanced approach. And so he actually was uh, at the legislature when the first season was being debated here um, two years ago and uh, testified in support of uh, the DNR's proposed season, which we have since implemented, as we talked about tonight. Mr. Stark, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. I, I do recall when uh, Representative Fabian had the bill that we uh, did have Dr. Meach before us, and I recall that conversation. Okay, so we have uh, three more. Representative Cornish, speaking of someone who would know about illegal taking of wool. <laughs> Former conservation <laughs> officer Cornish. Oh. <laughs> Um, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to lend some clarity after a lot of these comments here. Um, I <laughs> wholeheartedly support the uh, hunting and trapping of wolves, and I'll give you the reason why. Um, for 20 years, I was the ambassador for the DNR. I was the point man that would walk out in the heart of wolf territory and stand between the farmer and the state and decide whether his cow or sheep would be killed. I investigated those for 20 years, and it was the most frustrating thing in the, the world to do. I never met a farmer yet that wanted to see all the wolves wiped out. He just wanted, he or she wanted to be in the control of their own destiny. The uh, wolf, uh, I've got a lot of good letters from the people at Howell, I've got a lot of terrible letters and ignorant letters, good and bad, like you do from every user group. But some of the things that were said, they only kill the sick and the wounded. I had wolves come in, totally wipe out a flock of sheep and not eat a one of them. Uh, one farmer named Jack Upton, who has passed away near Mizpah, couldn't farm sheep anymore, even though he kept them fairly close to the building. Another one, Bruce Lowe, west of Northam, uh, had to quit farming sheep because they were slaughtered by the wolves. Now, uh, you're just like a pack of dogs. Once they get in there, they can't stop killing. The, when I came to North Home in 1974, the, brief, the uh, filing cabinet was full of wolf claims for bounty. Uh, or I came in 1980. Previous years, before they were delisted, there was actually a bounty. It went completely around the farmers being threatened with a $20,000 fine, so it was a total culture shock for a farmer who was used to be able to control his destiny to all of a sudden stand back and watch these cattle being slaughtered and so and taken. And as far as the depredation uh, protection, nothing works. I sat through 20 years of taste aversion where they would take a carcass of a cow, put not poison, but things were very bad for you, they hope to turn their, their taste away from cattle. It didn't work. I sat through dogs that were taken out there. There were professional trained dogs to keep the uh, timber walls out. Uh, that didn't work. Flashing yellow lights didn't work. Uh, boom cannons didn't work. The only thing that worked, sadly, was uh, you know, was the trapper, the federal trapper. I actually walked the trap line with David Meach, and he did support the tanking of walls because he knew that the next thing that was going to happen if they didn't was the taking of walls illegally. And as far as quickly on the taking of walls illegally, there were three cases in 20 years that I found, and I was in the woods a lot up there, next to my very efficient conservation officer in Big Falls. <laughs> and I only found three cases, and they never got charged. And you know the reason they didn't get charged? It was just an administrative fee where they had to pay because the prosecutor was afraid to take it to federal court and have a jury come in because he was pretty sure they would find him not guilty for defending their livestock and their farm. And so they were just given an administrative fee, and a couple of them were even given their gun back. So 
Um, I don't think you're going to find a big track record of poaching up there in the past because they're threatened with jail and $20,000 fines. You aren't going to find many people talking about it. <laughs> so that's kind of the history of it. Uh, the farmers and the hunters that I know of don't want the wolf wiped out. They just want a natural or a, a balance struck. We're not going to bring back the saber-toothed tiger or the woolly mammoth unless they clone that one they've got in the museum now. And but we've got the timber wolf, and we'd like to keep it, and so would the farmers and hunters, but they just want to control their destiny. And I think the, the plan the DNR has got, the best they can do with the tools that they have are uh, taking the assessments of the wolf and, and just like deer permits and meet out the permits as need be. And I don't want to see them wiped out anyway. I'd like to get a permit to hunt one, but I don't want to see them wiped out. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Rip Tim McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I probably mostly just want to make comments too, but uh, um, to the DNR, a couple of things. I want to say thank you for conservatively managing uh, the taking of the wolves by uh, hunters and trappers. Uh, we're not as aggressive as Wisconsin. Uh, some talked about uh, how good of a job Wisconsin's doing. Um, they're uh, taking a substantially larger percentage of their population than you are. I think we need to be conservative in our approach right now, and you're absolutely doing that. Um, uh, Dr. Meach did sit right at the table, right where the two of you are, and he was very important in our discussions and getting to where um, we got. Um, I think it's real important, and you've done a, a job of working with the tribes, um, uh, and that we work and respect uh, their feelings on this issue. It's a tough uh, thing to work with, and I, and I want you to continue to try uh, and work with them in respect. Uh, they have a, a uh, a different picture on this issue, and I think we have to respect that, and we do respect that, and uh, continue to work with them. That said, we're dealing with two very iconic species of animals here that we have talked about today, the gray wolf and also the moose. You know, it was kind of alarming to me to hear uh, Director Bogus talk about the 38 calves that were collared. I believe it was 38. I was thinking it was around 40. And do you know today that those calves, when they were born, had twice as much a probability to be killed by a wolf as to be alive today? And that was after we had a season when they were hunted the first time. And so we need to realize that we have to have a balance, and we want to try and keep the moose in northern Minnesota and I think we have to also realize there's a lot of timber wolves in northern Minnesota, and we can manage them in the way you are. And the reality is, I'm glad Representative Isaacson thinks you deserve a lot of money. I wish more on that side would have thought you deserved more money when we got you more money in 2011, when the Republicans passed Representative Hackbart's bill to properly fund the Department of Natural Resources. That was this side of the aisle that did that, and that's why, Mr. Stark, you are where you are today, and you have the adequate resources to get what he wants so that we properly manage this thing and go forward in a good way. And I hope we can do it in a bipartisan way. I hope the next time they're on board. They're doing real good at spending the money we raised. They're doing a good job of that. And I just hope they appreciate what we're doing. And, and thank you, and please continue to work, uh, especially with the Native Americans and, and their thoughts on this issue. I, I know when folks say we rushed at it, we waited, Representative Dill. How long? It was supposed to be a five-year waiting period. If I'm not mistaken, it was eight or nine. We didn't rush it. We actually waited longer than we were supposed to because it was supposed to get delist delisted long before. And it's a really neat thing to be in the northern woods of Minnesota where Representative Hackbart and Representative Fabian and I deer hunt and get to see one of the two ionic species in northern Minnesota. Because I will tell you, I think I've seen two timber wolves in my life when I've been in the woods and two moose. And you know what? I want my grandkids to have a chance to see both of them, not only one of them. And so I think and I hope that you'll continue to manage them in a way that that's proper for all of us. And thank you, Representative Dill, for having this, or Chairman Dill, for having this committee hearing. I guess I never even had a question, so I can't even camouflage it. I think we can pick up a lot of questions through your comments. <laughs> Representative Yabruso. And this will be the last question, uh, set of questions for the department, and then we'll go on to public testimony. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. This, this will actually be a question. Um, I have to preface it with a, a comment. Sometimes we, we do make decisions based on 90% confidence limits because um, you can't always do better than that, uh, especially in a cost-effective way. But um, so using the um, five-year survey followed by the one year using the indices to estimate, we've got this plus or five, we're, there's a one in 10 chance that we're outside the plus or minus 500. That's what the 90% confidence limit means. What is the difference in precision between the one-year estimates and the actual five-year survey? So with the one-year estimates, we get the plus or minus 500 with a 90% confidence. How much better do we do with the five-year survey? Mr. Stark. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Yeruso, we, we don't do an estimate an annually or we haven't in the past. Those indices do not provide us a, a population estimate. They provide us a trend. They tell us whether or not the population is going up or down between those surveys. Um, however, um, those indices over time and prior to implementing a season in 2012, we're at the highest levels we've ever recorded. And, and basically, they're track surveys. Um, so they're uh, where we detect wolf tracks and how frequently we detect wolf tracks along those survey routes. Um, but it does not provide us an estimate. We will be moving forward with doing an annual estimate each year based on radio colored wolves. We just are not going to be estimating the occupied range, which I mentioned was the second component of our, our survey. Representative um, Yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, thank you for clarifying that. So the, uh, the plus or minus 500, is that for the trend? That S, oh, excuse me. Dark. Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Russo, the confidence interval is based on estimated the, the error associated with pack size and territory size. That's where our our estimate of error is associated with during through for that survey. It's for the count. It's for the the population estimate that we we do. Representative Russo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not certain I have a clear idea then of what, what, to, um, what it applies to or what it doesn't apply to. What is, is the plus or minus 500 at the 90% confidence, the confidence interval for the actual survey that you do in every five years? Okay, so the, the um, I see nodding over there. Uh, I'm going to respond to that. So. That then would imply that the um, the uh, estimate, the, the error estimate, would be larger than that going forward. For every year you go forward after that, we would be less less confident than that. So if we started at at every five years, you well five whenever you did the five year survey, you were at plus or minus five hundred. Then your information you're using going forward from that based on the, the indices is not going to improve upon that confidence and it can only degrade after that. So in reality, we're at worse than that. Is, is that correct? Mr. Stark. <clears throat> Mr. Chair and Representative Yeruso, the population estimate and the associated confidence interval is based on the population estimate that we do that winter. It's not, it's not tied to indices. It's, a, it's the error associated with uh, pack size and territory size. That's how we come up with our confidence interval. It's estimated each winter when we do that survey estimate. It's not based on indices. Representative Yeruso. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I thought you just told me a c couple of moments ago that you don't do an estimate every year. But now you're saying it's based on the estimate for that winter's population. So I think we're getting muddied in what you're calling this and that and the other thing. So my understanding is that every five years you do an actual survey of the population and that in between those five-year intervals you do not do an actual survey of the population. 
but that by some other means you estimate the population. Although you told me you didn't. So my point is that if the plus or minus 500, if we're 90% certain that we're within plus or minus 500 at that five year survey, we won't be doing better than that at estimating the population in between. And I'm trying to get at what are the real limits on our, what we think this population is. And, and I'm afraid I'm getting more confused rather than less confused. Uh, yeah, Mr. Stark, could you clarify for one more time how that the, this has progressed and now I understand that you're doing a survey every year. Um, could, you, could you just quickly run through that, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the population estimates that I provided in this map, so these population estimates were initially conducted at every 10 years starting in 1978, more recently every five years. There is a confidence interval associated with these population estimates. In addition to this, we do annual indices that provide us information on population trends, essentially whether we see an increase or decrease from one year to the next. That, that's not an estimate. We don't re-estimate. We don't re-estimate in between those years. We just look at what the indice is, is telling us. Does it look like the population is increasing in between or, or decreasing based on detections of wolves along those survey routes? Right. Uh, so that we can make sure we accommodate all of the, uh, I, I'm certain that this could go on for a, a fair amount of time, but we do want to get to, I think we can take just about everybody that has signed up to testify, whether you put your name in the box or whether you put got your name on the list with Mr. Strohmeyer in advance. Uh, so you're going to have three minutes. So I'm going to call down three or four people and get ready to testify. You'll have three minutes. Mr. Strohmeyer, to my left, has a 30-second um, sign, and at the 30-second point, he'll display that. And then uh, if uh, you approach the end and you go uh, a few seconds over, we'll uh, bring it to your attention and you can end your testimony. So uh, we had one request because of a long, long distance, although I have to tell you I see people here from Orrin Cook and Virginia. So uh, Mr. Uh, Terry Tibbetts, we're going to move you to the top of the list so you can head uh, back to the White Earth uh, First Nation. And then we'll have Tim Spreck from Minnesota Outdoor Heritage Alliance, Howard Goldman from the Ameri Humane Society, and Dr. Adrian Trevs. You can get prepared, that way we can make the most of our time. Welcome to the committee, state your name, who you represent, and go ahead with your testimony. Mr. Chairman, committee members, my name is Terrence Tibbetts, I'm the District 2 representative for the White Earth Tribal Council. Welcome. And on uh, August 12, 2012, the White Earth Tribal Council enacted a declaration designating the White Earth Reservation as a wolf sanctuary. I did provide a copy for each and every one of you. All lands within the exterior boundaries of the White Earth Reservation are set aside as a wolf sanctuary. The reservation boundaries were established in the Treaty of 1867 with the United States government. The White Earth Tribal Government does not permit hunting, trapping, or other destruction of wolves within the boundaries of the White Earth Reservation. <clears throat> the Minnesota Legislature's hasty and acting, enacted law which, which authorized the Commissioner of Natural Resources to implement a wolf hunt and trapping season in 2012 was made without consultation to the White Earth Nation or any other tribal nations. The state's enactment of the wolf hunt is very controversial among the tribal nations in the state of Minnesota. And the absence of consultation prior to the law's enactment is very concerning to whiter as is to other tribal nations. After passage of the state law authorizing the Minnesota wolf hunt, whiter officials met with the state commissioner of natural resources and other DNR staff on several occasions in efforts to educate the agency on the White Earth's establishment of this sanctuary. White Earth officials request that the Commissioner of Natural Resources exercise the authority granted by him state law to close all lands within the boundaries of the White Earth Reservation. 
Let me see here. The Commissioner of Natural Resources refused to adjust the wool fund so that it would not take place on the White Reservation. The Commissioner has thereby refused to respect tribal law, specifically the White of Nations establishment of a wolf sanctuary on the reservation. The Tribal Executive Committee of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe and the governing body of the six Anishinaabe reservations consisting of Whiter, Leech Lake, Boys Fort, Mille Lacs, Grand Portage, Fond du Lac, have also enacted tribal law confirming the authority of each constituent reservation to regulate wildlife within, within the reservation boundaries as well in this, as the ceded territories outside the boundaries of the reservation. That is in the copy of the resolution that's attached. Additionally, the Tribal Executive Committee has confirmed the authority of the each constituent reservation 30 seconds. to establish a wolf sanctuary with the exterior boundaries of the reservation where there are no taking of wolves permitted. Again, the Commissioner of Natural Resources has refused to adjust the state wolf sons so as it is conducted in conformity with tribal law. On behalf of the wider nation, I am now requesting that the Minnesota legislature respect tribal law Adjust the state wolf fund so that it does not take place within the exterior boundaries of the reservation. Miigwech. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for coming down from Whiter. Thank, Thank you. you. Tim Spreck. <clears throat> the next person in line, uh, B. Howard Goldman, uh, Dr. Adrian Trevs, and Maureen Hackett from Howling with Wolves. And we'll just continue to call people down if you can get ready. Uh, Mr. Spreck, introduce yourself, please. Mr. Chair and committee members, my name is Tim Spreck. I'm president of the Minnesota Outdoor Heritage Alliance. MOHA represents approximately 400,000 sportsmen and women in the state of Minnesota through our 70 member groups. I'm here today to talk to you about the wolf season and why it's important to the hunting population in the state of Minnesota. The most important thing to remember is that wolves, like any other species, need to be managed. When they interact with humans and livestock and, and other uh, factors around the state, we can't leave nature to its own device. They need to be managed, and that's where we come in and we help that happen through the DNR. The, the management tool that the DNR is, has uh, employed on the, with the wolf season is, is to allow the hunting and trapping. Without this, management, we would have serious problems with overpopulation, depredation. We've already discussed already this evening the deer or the uh, moose problem and also the predation on deer, livestock, and domesticated animals. Management provides opportunities for hunters plus the licensed revenue that it provides. For a lot of people, there's a livelihood that's involved here, whether it's sale of pelts or, or other uh, we have to make sure that we're making uh, allowances for all types of people, not just being dominated by emotional responses to, to things like uh, beautiful, majestic animals. It's more than that. It has to be about the management. The hunt has been successful, and in the opinion of the people that I represent and the organization that I'm here today to speak on behalf of, it has been very well done and very uh, uh, conservatively managed by the DNR. As, a, as a, uh, uh, a case in point, consider the first year's hunt took roughly 400 animals. The DNR discovered that their population estimates needed to be re-looked uh, at. They dropped the hunt down significantly. They've been very sensitive to population numbers, and the outdoor sporting and hunting community in particular is holding their feet to the fire to make sure that they continue to do, that, do so into the future. We want to make sure that the wolf population is viable, strong, and healthy, and as they manage and change the quotas of, of animals that are taken each year, they will make sure that that's viable and that continues into the future. Uh, and with those comments, I'll, I'll stand down and let somebody else come up. But understand that wolf management is a very important part of this piece. It's not just about the emotion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spreck. Mr. Goldman, welcome again, Mr. Goldman. Nice to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Nice to see you too, Chairman Neal. <clears throat> My name is Howard Goldman. I'm the Minnesota State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. And we have 170,000 members in the state. I was a member of the Minnesota DNR Wolf Roundtable in 1998. I represented the Humane Society at the Wolf delisting hearings in Grand Rapids and in Ashland, Wisconsin. The wolf is not just another game species came off the endangered species list only two years ago. We don't eat wolves. 
The wolf hunt was not set up to control the population. Wolves that kill livestock now are being trapped by the USDA and the DNR. And farmers and landowners can legally kill a wolf that depredates on livestock. There are 165,000 cows and calves in wolf territory. Last year, according to the DNR, 2013, there were only 65 confirmed livestock complaints. 165,000 calves in the state. This doesn't form the basis for a hunt. There's only one reason we're hunting wolves, and that's for trophies in sport. What's happened to the wolf population since the first hunt in 2012? Nothing good. Last year, the DNR completed a statewide wolf population census, concluded that the wolf population had declined by 25 percent, 710 wolves. Wolves are a public trust. They're in the hands of the state for the benefit of, of all its citizens. And the public's not behind the hunt. The only survey that was conducted by the DNR, electronic survey, before the hunt began, had 79% of the respondents opposing the hunt. Further, there's scientific, a lot of scientific uncertainty regarding the impact of these hunts on the packs themselves. When breeders or the alpha wolves are killed, packs collapse. We've seen that in Yellowstone. There's two research papers, one from Montana State University, the other from the Alaska Game and Fish Department, indicated that 20, if one breeder is killed, 25% of the packs collapse. If two breeders are killed, 75% of the packs collapse. There's so much uncertainty about this. Moreover, we may not know the full impact on the populations for several years if a breeder is killed. What is the rush to kill wolves? These aren't stalks of corn. These are highly intelligent, complex creatures. We must reinstate the five-year moratorium, which was part of the original Wolf Roundtable recommendations, no public taking for five years. We must err on the side of caution. Too much is at stake to do anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Always a pleasure. Uh, Dr. Adrian Treves, please. And then uh, Maureen Hackett will be next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Adrian Trevis, uh, Associate Trevis. Professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison. I got my PhD in predator-prey behavioral ecology. For the last 14 years, I've been studying wolf management, ecology, behavior in Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan. Um, I'm an independent scientist, although I've been invited here by previous testifiers because of the work I've done. And in particular, I'd like to speak about the work that I've done on predicting where depredations will occur, lethal control, non-lethal control of depredations, attitudes towards wolves and wolf policy, and more recently on poaching and uh, mortality factors and population dynamics under harvest in wolves. So first, uh, in 2004, we published a peer-reviewed risk map, which is a spatial predictive model of where depredations will occur in Minnesota and in Wisconsin. We achieved 77% predictive power, which wasn't good enough at the time. We've improved it, uh, good enough in my opinion. We've improved it for Wisconsin. We now can predict the locations where 91% of depredations will occur. And uh, over half of those occur in less than 7% of Wisconsin. We have not yet updated the Minnesota risk map in that way, but I'd like to point out that one of my co-authors, Liz Harper, works for the Minnesota DNR, so it's very possible, and I'm happy to participate if, if needed. So if we're able to predict where depredations occur, I've been advocating as a scientist for a scientifically designed hunt in Wisconsin which would target specifically livestock depredators. The second issue I'd like to talk about are attitudes and the uh, specifically tolerance for wolves. We've been conducting human attitude surveys since 2001 in Wisconsin only and this past year we were able to complete a before and after survey of attitudes of the same individuals in 2009, and then those, those same individuals resampled in 2013 after Wisconsin held the 2012 wolf harvest. We found no improvement in tolerance among residents of wolf range. In fact, we found a decline in tolerance. So at least in the short term, 
hopes that a wolf harvest will improve tolerance for wolves seem to be unfounded in the short term. Third, uh, monitoring is and precise annual monitoring of wolf populations and their interactions with people has proven very useful in Wisconsin. I would encourage Minnesota to attempt it because it's allowed us both to create the risk maps I discussed, to study human attitudes towards poaching, towards lethal control, towards a harvest, and to compensation policy, just to list a few of the questions we ask our respondents. And finally, yep. very precise annual monitoring provides uh, that's information. Your three minutes, sir. Thank you very much for coming before us. Okay, Miss Hackett, and then uh, Kathleen, uh, uh, Kathleen uh, Swaybar, Jim Mokowski, and Neil Ross. Hi, Welcome I'm to Hackett. Good evening, Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify today regarding the wolf management in Minnesota. I'm Maureen Hackett, and I founded Howling for Wolves. Howling for Wolves is a wolf advocacy group that is, uh, the goal is the long-term survival of the wolf. Um, we formed in 2012, and to be honest with you, we, we did form as a result of uh, the, what we saw as the lack of implementation of the wolf management plan. And part of that uh, involved the hunt, but there are many other aspects of it. Um, I was hoping that we could get more from uh, Adrian Trevis. He did make a, a statement about uh, poaching and today we'll, I want to just give the uh, members of the committee, I handed out four handouts. One is my written statement which is uh, too long to read here. Another is a statement from a northern Minnesota resident who talks about poaching and some of the things that he's been hearing from the DNR. Um, and another handout uh, that you have is the 1998 executive summary on consensus agreement for the Wolf Roundtable. And the reason I, I gave that to you is for you to see all the insights and all the work that has already been done. And back in 1998, uh, the Wolf Roundtable consensus was, look, we'll accept the population monitoring, we'll try to get more exact, but most importantly, we need to work on wolf depredation management. Howling for Wolves would like to work on wolf depredation management too. We understand that People have the right to protect their livestock. They have the right to protect human life. We understand that. We do not challenge that. Uh, we are not an anti-hunting group. But one of the things that uh, Dr. Trevis uh, addressed and needs to be addressed is that a major part of the wolf management plan is human attitudes. You can't really live with wolves and have a hunt or not have a hunt and, and count them or don't count them and manage their depredation or non-lethal, lethal, all of that without human cooperation. Um, we, we started off on the wrong foot by not getting a baseline survey. I, I know that people may uh, poo-poo that and say, well, that's fine, but it was five years from the last survey. So we don't know if the hunt wiped out 25% of the population or if the population was on the way down. I think the moose data is being taken out of context. I think the DNR, if they were asked carefully, would agree with that. But the bottom line is the, um, the wolf management plan was a well thought out plan. We support it. We would like to see much more best management practices encouraged, much more non-lethal, and we, we don't fight the lethal control, but much more non-lethal control, more sharing of data, more databases kept on where the wolves are and, and how they're doing and what the disease prevalence is and what the death rates are. And um, we understand that probably the attitudes towards wolves actually may have taken a turn for the worse with the hunt. We have seen that in communications coming toward us at Howling for Wolves. We've, uh, we've seen people talking about that, and I think you'll hear more about it. And finally, the indiscriminate methods. The snaring is uh, extremely... Um, indiscriminate, it catches a lot of other non-target species. People leave those snares out, they don't retrieve them, they're very inexpensive, they can use multiple ones. It is a very painful uh, process for the wolf and they're usually found alive with a swollen head from brain bleeds. All right, I'm going to have to have you so, close. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Kathleen? Thank you very much. My name is Kathleen Swaver. I live and work on a small farm just north of Duluth, Minnesota on the shores of Lake Superior. 
My home is surrounded by acres of wa wild watershed land that is home to a variety of animal species, including wolves. As a farmer and a hunter, I believe that everyone shares the responsibility to understand the importance of the different animal species and to help maintain balance in the environment we share with them. Keeping domestic livestock and pets comes with a reasonable and manageable risk of conflict with wild animals that may be attracted to them as easy prey. While I acknowledge this risk, I do not consider it to be a threat. The real threat is poor livestock management, people who carelessly leave garbage outside, or purposely bait hunting targets such as bears. They increase the risk of conflict by teaching wild animals that humans can be a source of easy food. It is no coincidence that fishers, fox, and wolves began exploring closer to homes or that domestic animals disappeared from my neighborhood as soon as wild predators learned that neighbors were setting bear bait in the woods last summer. Prior to that, the only conflicts I had were with migrating raptors and they were isolated. When I researched the laws and policies of baiting wild animals, I was disappointed to learn how little baiting activity is regulated. Although I was able to find restrictions for baiting in proximity to landfills and campsites, I was unable to find protection for businesses like mine or for the licensed daycare located half a mile down the road. Given the fact that baiting wild animals has so few restrictions, I feel that I have little control over the disruptions on my farm or in my neighborhood as the results of the actions of others. As I researched more options and sought advice, I learned that funds are available to compensate for animals lost to depredation, and that there are circumstances under which I could legally kill predators that attack them. There's, these are clearly described in the 2001 Minnesota Wolf Management Plan. Also included in the Wolf Management Plan are best management practices. They are described as agricultural management practices that may result in the reduction or prevention of depredation of livestock by wolves and other predators and went on to state that the MNDA has developed a guide to BMPs that will continue to develop and update and distribute this information to Minnesota livestock producers. I believe it is far more efficient to fund and study methods that prevent conflict with wildlife than it is to react to it once it occurs, and that information about best management practices should continue to be developed, updated, and tested, and be readily available to anyone who lives in proximity to wolves. Whether we live in the city or the country, we are all Minnesotans. Therefore, we have a duty to understand the environment and coexist with wildlife in ways that are based in science and ethics rather than stereotypes and emotions. Thank you for holding this hearing and accepting citizen input. And thank you for coming. All right, so now we'll have uh, uh, Jim. And then Neil Ross and then John Fisher and then Jim Aker. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm a naturalist by profession. I've li have made my living all my life for 55 years being a professional naturalist. Uh, but lest you think that has only, since most of my professional career has been in environmental education as a naturalist, lest you think that it's only about the lilliums and the trilliums and the chickadees and the bluebirds, I want to also give you the credentials uh, that I'm a product of the University of Wisconsin and kind of the grandchild of Aldo Leopold, having been taught by the people who, taught, who were taught by Aldo Leopold directly. Uh, I also was the founder of the last chapter of the National Wildlife Federation in Nebraska, for they were unable to formulate a chapter, and we issued the caveat, if you would expand your horizons to all of the natural environment, not just hunting fishing, we would help sponsor you. So we were responsible and I was a co-sponsor. I served in Kenya, East Africa, for three months to uh, advocate the wildlife management program there because the wildlife was just recently put under the aegis of the, of the government. And so my job was to go out and, and educate the people in the countryside, oftentimes through interpreters, as to why wildlife management was important. Uh, I was the pioneer of one of the first nature centers in the United States starting in 63 in Nebraska, which is how we got the strong advocacy, and uh, retired from the Dodge Nature Center here as their CEO in 1996. So despite not having the privilege of testifying before you, I thank you for this opportunity. But I come before you to make a case, the case to seriously reduce, 
I'm not saying don't hunt. Reduce the hunting and taking of the, uh, trapping of the wolves in Minnesota. I'd like, to, I'd like to advocate no hunting or trapping of wolves at this time, but concede to where we are at the moment. So I'm not advocating that at this time. I'm advocating to lessen what I believe to be an unnecessary amount of killing a high-profile threatened wild species of mammal, of course, a predator to the gray wolf. So I wanted to make that case. However, while I've been asked to talk about statistics and competitive numbers and reasons, which has been done to a great degree uh, this evening, I could do so. But all of these are flawed. All. They are biased. And the point that I want to make is that all of the discussions and debates from all sides of the table come together and you are forced to make a decision. I respect the fact and want to believe that you want to make the right thing happen and do the right thing. And therefore, I also re want to respect that about the researchers. But the truth is there are various opinions on all sides of this. So I submit to you that the problems with us in many resources, wolves not being different, we, it's not what we commit to doing, it's the overreaching after we decide what to do. Thank we you. overreach. Thank you. And so this is what I would ask you simply. Thank you, sir. To sir, under, if I be just get one word, underreach, no. sir. Rather your than your time overreach. is up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ross. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Neil Ross. I live in Minnetonka. I spent my career in trade publishing, where my lead client was Dr. Jane Goodall. She was the party responsible for my interest and growing enthusiasm in the great raptors. My work with hawks and eagles led me to the wolf and helped me to understand the grave importance of predators to all residents of the state. Those with tags, those without tags, those with farmsteads, and those without. As a volunteer educator for the Raptor Center, I learned that red tails reviled because of the myth that they took all the farmers' chickens were really patrolling the corn rows for the mice and rats and ate them. Thanks to the hawk, the farmer's yields were more successful. Again, on April 7, 1917, the day after we entered the First World War, Alaska's legislature claimed eagles would ruin their salmon business, declared war on the species, posted bounties on it. Those bounties lasted for 36 years, and more than 150 eagles, thousand eagles died, and an untold number remained missing. In the lower 48, commercial forces blasted DDT below, uh, in the, throughout the lower 48, which drove the eagle into virtual ex extinction. Lawmakers had a choice then. They have a choice now. They can either let markets dictate the laws by which we live or demand that markets serve us. Our DNR's wolf management plan responds to market forces as Representative Isaacson indicated so well. As, and, and positions the gray as a problem, not as a resource. And like Alaska's legislature, our lawmakers have bowed to exaggerated claims, not in all cases, but in many cases, that wolves were decimating the hunting industry, taking enormous numbers of livestock and plunging farms into ruin. This DNR relied on the dated species census before staging its 2012 hunts, then revealed their miscounts before hunts resumed in fall 2013. I'm a smart guy, and having listened to all this statistical jargon left and right, and listening with respect to Mr. Stark's data, and he presented us with lots of data, I am a smart man, and I am confused. Because the measures that were used to estimate counts for the wolf in 2013 had varying levels of statistical reliability. The DNR must make good faith attempts to explore the relocation of packs to suitable habitat here. And so I ask the department to consider detailing its plan to secure such territory through lease or purchase, donations or bequests, legal transfers, or eminent domain. I thank you. And I thank you for the chance to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Uh, Mr. Fisher, and then Mr. Aker, and then Mr. Elliott. Okay, well, I thank the chair and the committee for a chance to address you today. Um, my name is John Fisher. I'm a rural mixed practice veterinarian up in Cook, Minnesota. 
30 years in private practice. I also have a degree in wildlife management. And before I started private practice, I worked as a biologist at Voyagers National Park. And I just want to, we, currently we have a very robust wolf population and that's seen considerable growth in recent years. Um, I can say that by, by living up in that area. Our moose population currently is small and in swift decline and near collapse. And I want to talk to you today as an advocate of our moose population. Cut things short here, I did some research on, on when the, the uh, uh, the uh, DNR was saying that uh, global warming was the cause of uh, our moose decline. So I started doing some research and found out that actually moose are doing quite well in other areas around the world, particularly in areas like New England and Sweden where there are, um, uh, there's a lot of timber management but also very few wolves. Further research revealed that there were areas of Alaska and Northwest Canada where declines in moose numbers very similar that's occurring to Minnesota. Uh, studies have been done in these places to identify the causes of the, these declines. These studies identified the cause of the drop in moose numbers because of high rates of predation by wolves and bears, particularly on moose calves. And these studies showed about 80% mortality rates in moose calves from bear and wolf predation. And correspondingly high levels of wolf predation on adult moose causing these moose populations to plummet. <laughs> Furthermore, these studies also showed that the management of wolf and bear populations by increasing harvest levels of moose and bear resulted in recovery of these moose populations. Right now the DNR is in the process of a moose mortality study and I was very interested in that and it's not complete. However, after one year the data so far closely replicates these studies done in Alaska. So far moose calf mortality in Minnesota is running about 85%. Some of these statistics were, were mentioned earlier this evening. With about 75% of the mortality coming from wolf predation, adult mor moose mortality is running at 20%, over half of which is wolf predation or wolf-related injuries. In combination, this is causing a disastrously high level of mortality, which is causing the steep decline of the moose in Minnesota. Uh, but the data for, by far shows the number one cause of moose mortality in Minnesota is wolf-related. However, if one takes all the data so far from the study, figuring pregnancy rates, 20 rates, and assuming all their forms of mortality stay constant, it can be demonstrated that just a 15% reduction in wolf predation would result in a stable or growing moose population in Minnesota. When the moose mortality study is complete, the Minnesota DNR needs to acknowledge that like other state and provincial conservation organizations already have, that moose and wolf management are intertwined. We need to have and use management tools like hunting and trapping seasons to maintain sustainable and healthy populations of both moose and wolves. I'm not advocating eradicating wolves. Preservation of the Minnesota wolf herd will benefit the wolf population in the long run providing, by providing a sustainable prey base. Wildlife needs to be managed for the greatest good for the greatest number of the human population, letting a particular species Thank run you, rampant. Sure. Am I real done? That's it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. <laughs> and now Mr. Aker. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair and the committee. My name is uh, James Aker. I am from Orem, Minnesota, and I am a Minnesotan concerned about the survival of our moose herd. Here in Minnesota, hunters and trappers have a long tradition as a primary tool in wildlife management. This management legacy is entrusted to our own DNR, whose management philosophy is guided by field research and data gathered from their counterparts in other states and from Canada. In the issue of the sharp decline of our Minnesota moose population, it is becoming increasingly obvious as recent research shows that over predation by timber wolves is a key factor in this decline, especially among collared moose calves whose attrition rate is approximately 75% due to wolf predation. Wildlife managers here in Minnesota are learning what their counterparts in Alaska and Canada have long known, that predator management is key in maintaining a sustainable moose population. In British Columbia, where my brother owns and operates a guide outfitter territory, wildlife managers strive to maintain at least a 60% cow to calf moose ratio by using hunters and trappers as their number one predator management tool. As a result, they have a healthy and sustainable moose and wolf population. Sadly, here in Minnesota, we are not even reaching a 25% calf survival rate. 
In my own experience in the 45 years I have traversed and hunted in the wilderness areas of northern Minnesota, I have noted as our white-tailed deer numbers have declined, timber wolves have changed their hunting tactics by deploying larger pack numbers of 10 plus wolves, evolving, so to speak, to greatly increase their efficiency at moose predation, especially in late winter's deep encrusted snow when sheer pack size and where the prey down tactics greatly increase the attrition rate of both adult and calf moose. As we all know much too well, three of the last four winters have been particularly harsh, placing a heavy strain in our northern deer herd and remaining <coughs> moose population. I believe it would be a betrayal of public trust if we ignore the facts of the recent moose study and let wolf management and our moose be sacrificed at the altar of political correctness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Aker. And now, Mr. Elliott. Then we will have uh, the Sierra Club, uh, then uh, Barry Babcock and Scott Slocum. Mr. Thanks, Elliott, Mr. welcome. Chairman and committee members, my name is Jeff Elliott. I live in Virginia, Minnesota. I've worked since 1968 as a forester. I've been employed by a couple large timber companies, and now I run my own forestry consulting business. I also enjoy the outdoors, including camping, fishing, hunting birds and deer, and observing all types of wildlife. I'm out in the field three to five days a week, and so I have a pretty good feel for what's going on, probably within a radius of 100 miles of the city of Virginia. As for wolves, over the years I've had the opportunities to see wolves frequently, and often see them from my pickup while I'm working. Also, I usually see wolf signs, scat, tracks, or deer kills just about every time I go in the woods. From my observation, the wolf population is healthy as large as it has ever been. My information is anecdotal, but given the discussion previously by all of these surveys, it can't be that bad. So I consider the timber wolf a big game species and hope at some time to draw a permit to, to take one. As for deer and moose, I also get to see these animals on a regular basis, but the past few years I'm seeing a lot less of them. The deer in much of northern Minnesota have suffered a very difficult winter last year and are enduring another one this year. As a result of the severe winter last year, I've seen very few fawns all last spring, summer, and fall. Uh, no one in our deer camp saw any fawns during the hunting season. Incidentally, we did see a couple of wolves. Also, the recent DNR study on moose showed that heavy predation on, showed heavy predation on moved moose calves by wolves. It is not unreasonable to conclude that the same is also happening to the fawn populations. What should we do? To keep a healthy wolf population, which I would like to see, we need to manage them through a hunting and trapping season to significantly reduce their numbers to allow the moose and deer populations to recover. If this is not accomplished, those species will go into a worse decline and will result in the wolf population also declining dramatically as a result of lack of available food. If they don't decline, they'll just go away. We're just going to have less of them. I definitely do not want to see any of the populations of these beautiful wolf, deer, and moose go into a decline that can be prevented by common sense management. The DNR must continue the wolf season and for the time being increase the wolf harvest to allow the deer and moose population to recover. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Norgard from the Sierra Club. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Lois. I'm a volunteer speaking for Sierra Club this evening. Uh, Sierra Club is really gravely concerned that we are fast approaching a population threshold that would undo years of efforts to recover Minnesota's wolves. Uh, the wolf is actually a keystone species, very important for the habitat that it embodies. It's important to the health of the whole ecosystem. Wolves will tend to limit their own numbers to stay in balance with their prey and are essential to maintaining the health of other wildlife through culling out the sick and old and controlling their movements to reduce browse on vegetation. This in turn helps to ensure that the rest of the forest remains healthy for everything from the insects to the birds to the other wildlife species that are dependent on it, even to the other predators. Studies from the reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone conclude that preservation or recovery of gray wolves may represent an important conservation need for helping to maintain the resiliency of wildland ecosystems, especially with the rapidly changing climate. 
Even human health is helped by predators, wolves and others. In fact, control of Lyme's disease is one of the things that's been shown. The more we develop in our forests and fragment our forests, the more we reduce the predators, the more we increase the vector species. The wolf is a public trust for all citizens. Wildlife viewing raises $400 a year in Minnesota. Tourists come to hear and see the wolf and have those memories forever. Our resource agency has not done a good job of taking advantage of this amazing wildlife asset. The wolf pack is a family union. It creates deeply connected parenting and family bonds that are very long lived and integral to their survival. Indiscriminately killing parents will leave younger pups at risk. A random hunt is not sound science for this particular kind of species. Human intolerance is their main em enemy. Unlike prey species, removing a member of the family unit will destroy this interconnection, disrupting not only the cooperating, coordinating unity of the pack, but also if you kill a family member, it breaks up the pack's relationships and risks their health, life, and spirit. We believe that there must be monitoring, better monitoring for the take numbers in Minnesota, including the take of uh, illegal take, the accidents, and natural deaths. The current estimate may fall below the accepted minimum 1,600 right now. The models used are an understandably simplification. It is very hard to verify population levels of wolves. Presently at the 90% confidence level of our range is inaccurate. Modeling being used has not been validated. We need to do that with all human cause mortality like cars, illegal killing, and the hunt, we could have lost 900 to 1,000 wolves within the first year. DNR has been prevented from fulfilling its full ob obligation under the uh, uh, monitoring plan that it should have put in for the plan. DNR should discontinue the hunting until we have better reasonable data about the minimum goals and how much population we have existing. We should put back the monitoring for the five-year plan, and we should manage our wolves Thank with very much. full public involvement. Thank you. Thank you for the chance to uh -huh. comment here this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Babcock, Mr. Slocum, then Ann Bever. Go to the next three. Mr. Chair and committee members, my name is Barry Babcock. I came down here today from the Bemidji area. I live near the Cass, Beltrami, and Hubbard line uh, boundaries. And uh, I live in the woods. I live a semi-recluse life uh, for the last 10 years. Prior to that, my wife and I are independent motel operators in a small community in Cass County. Before that, I worked in the woods. Um, I'm a, I've been this coming deer hunting season 2014 will be the 50th year that I've been hunting deer in that north central area around Bemidji, Calf Lake, and Walker. Uh, I'm a traditional bow hunter. I tie my own strings, make my own arrows. I was a I dropped my membership, but I was a member of the Pope and Young Club for taking two record uh, record book bucks. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, my experience as a deer hunter and the number of deer and wolves in the state. <coughs> Uh, I've been reading in the paper, hook and bullet reporters talking about uh, lack of deer in the state, a lot of deer hunters talking about lack of deer. I can't speak for northeastern Minnesota, I've never hunted up there, although I visit the Boundary Waters a lot. But in our area, I'm seeing just, uh, we're bursting at the seams with an overpopulated deer herd. I can't propagate, I planted over 8,000 conifers on my land, white, red, jack pine, white spruce, and balsam fir. I doubt if I got 50 left, I bud capped and sprayed with pig blood, did everything I could think of. Um, deer hunting used to be really tough back in the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. Up there, we shot the first thing you saw. If it was a fawn, you shot it because you weren't likely to see anything else. Now, um, deer hunting, well, what we were given, we were allowed five bonus tags during the tooth, like from about 2000 up to 2008. We could take five antlerless deer and one buck or, or adult doe. Uh, and I got wolves all over my place. I, I, my nearest neighbor's a mile away. I live with wolves. I'm within a mile of wolf dens. Less than that for a rendezvous site. I run into wolves all the time. I have dogs. I keep my dogs with me. I don't let them run loose because I know wolves hate dogs. I found that living with wolves takes extra, is something that you have to learn how to do. But to me, I don't find wolves dangerous. I find when I, when I come across a wolf and he looks in my eyes, I find it exciting. Um, I had one instant where I sat down taking a break, grouse hunting with my field Springer Spaniel. I unloaded my double barrel because dogs shoot more hunters than, do than hunters do. And uh, a wolf came through the woods. It was coming for my dog. She came behind me. 
Before I knew it, the wolf was right in front of me, and I grabbed the cap off my head and hit, it, hit him on the head, and he went off. Uh, I was told I should have shot him, and maybe I would have then. But um, I found that a lot of the complaining about there not being enough deer, I think, is more a result of a motorized invasion into our woods of ATVs and pickup trucks. Our opening morning, and I live in the woods, it sounds like camp maneuvers at Camp Ripley. Deer are not stupid. Neither are wolves. When they hear all these machines into the woods, they become nocturnal. I get them on Thank my you. game camera. They're moving between 10 o'clock at night and 5 o'clock in the morning. Thank Am you. I, my time's up? Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Boy, that goes fast. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Scott? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Scott Slocum, resident of White Bear Lake, Minnesota. It's obvious that a lot of good work went into this uh, wolf management plan, Minnesota Wolf Management Plan. I have this 2001 document here. And um, as a lot of people before me have pointed out, it has a lot of features in it. And we have been selective in which ones we've been enacting. Uh, one of my favorite ones is here on page 21. It, uh, it says, where wolves are not in conflict with humans, they will be left alone. Where they are in conflict with humans, problem wolves will be removed. Another one is the, the non-lethal controls. I think there's a lot of room for us to do more in that area. And room for us to do more in, in developing reasonable human tolerance. This plan, uh, back in 2001, um, just looked forward to a future in which there might be a recreational hunting and trapping seasons. Um, the fact is that uh, we don't need them. We don't need those recreational hunting and trapping seasons. We have a good uh, wolf management plan as it is, and it's better off without the recreational hunting and trapping seasons, I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Ann Bever? Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much. <coughs> and Robert Chemek is next, and then Dennis Yudovich. Go ahead. My, your thank you. My name is Ann Beaver, and I am a resident of um, Bloomington, and this is my first time testifying. And I felt um, compelled to come here, and there are, uh, are wonderful experts here who know so much more than I do. But I want to offer um, another view of this and another perspective. Um, I'd like to start by asking if any of you have heard of a man named Aaron Ralston. He is an experienced mountain climber who set out on a day trip in 2003 and found himself in an underground crevice with his hand lodged between the wall of the crevice and a boulder that had shifted and um, trapped his hand. He tried to free himself, but nothing worked. Aaron was alone and not having left a note for his family, no one knew where he was. He, in one of his videos, said that he was trapped and standing in his own grave. Aaron described thoughts of infection, starvation, dehydration, sleep deprivation, hypothermia, and various body and mental breakdowns, which occurred over one, two, three, four, and five days. He described this pain in one of his videos as a thousand times worse than having a boulder crush his hand, and that boulder that came down was 800 pounds, and stated it was the worst pain he had ever felt. Um, on the fifth night, he had a vision and ended up um, following that. And he broke his, uh, the bones in his arm, cut his tendons, and cut the nerve. He was able to free himself, and he walked to safety. And when he re was rescued, he was hours away from bleeding to death. But he survived. Very, very incredible man. And in thinking of his story over all these years, since 2003, I periodically think of the horror that he went through in, in being trapped. And when I heard of the wolf hunt, I instantly got these visions 
of that awful, awful feeling. I'm, I'm sorry. And he was able to verbalize what the wolves can't in being trapped. Um, the wolves didn't have food or t uh, tools to get themselves free. And Aaron did what he called a surgical amp amp <coughs> amputation. And so I am here to just offer a different perspective of something that moved me greatly that happened to a human. And hope that you may remember what I said. And also this was thank incredibly you. fearful for me to do. So thank you for listening. I understand. I and, really, really and I'm glad appreciate you, and it. And I'm glad you came today. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so the next person is Robert. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Welcome. I distributed a paper earlier, The Wolf is My Brother. Hopefully that will give you a little bit of insight into the cultural, the historic, and the spiritual relationship between the Anishinaabe, the Indian people of Minnesota, and my Inganug, the wolves. I am from the Mud Lake District of the White Earth Indian Reservation. And make no mistake about it, it is the White Earth Indian Reservation. It is not the White Earth White Man Reservation. That is not the title, okay? I didn't come here <coughs> to necessarily be nice and issue a lot of platitudes and praise for the Wolf Management Plan because you have excluded, you have ignored, you have turned your shoulder to the tribes and their appeals to have the reservations excluded from the wolf hunt. Repeatedly the tribes have gone on record <clears throat> stating their concern about the wolf hunt and the ability for the great white hunter to come onto the White Earth Indian Reservation and other reservations and begin the killing of our wolf brother. We intended to inform the legislature, the governor, the commissioner of the DNR, and Dan Stark of the DNR of our concerns. The legislature did nothing. The governor won't even respond to us anymore. The commissioner said go to the legislature. Dan Stark did nothing. All we asked was to let tribes manage wolves within their reservation boundaries. In my mind and in the mind of many others, this is one of the most racist and colonialistic pieces of legislation that has come out of this body in many, many years. When a white person from the Fish and Wildlife Service says no wolf hunting on national wildlife refuges, the DNR, the state goes, okay. When a white person from the state parks says no wolf hunting on the state parks, the DNR says, okay. When a native woman from the White Earth Indian Reservation says no wolf hunting on our reservation, she is ignored. <clears throat> About the poaching, I told Dan Stark, go to the bars in northern Minnesota. The story is there about what's happening to the wolves. This session of the legislature can turn around all this colonialism, this, this, slit, <clears throat> this racism, let this legislature be the one that tells the world that we will legislate based on principles of tolerance, inclusion, and respect. Exclude the reservations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, for coming. Dennis, you're going to go. Dennis Udovich. Then we are going to have uh, Lee, K-A-P-H-I-N-G-S-T, uh, Denise Keeney, and Jeff Wagner. Those will be the next three up. Thank you, Chair and the committee, uh, for hearing this testimony today. Really do appreciate it. We are all stakeholders in this room here today, and there's a lot of passion in all the people that have been talking. So I'm going to just cut through the chase. A lot of times I don't know what I'm going to say when I get here, but... Uh, I'm from northern Minnesota. I live uh, just south of the Boys Ford Indian Reservation 
and I'm a hunter, trapper, and a guide. Uh, when this season came along, I did some testimony at the Wolf Stewards meeting uh, to get the season going. I was a big promoter, and I think it's respect of the animal, uh, and I think we're getting that. I'm hearing a lot of different things out there. Uh, people aren't shooting the, uh, the wolves and killing them. We got a season in place, and I think the DNR are doing a great job. A lot of times, people really don't know, and I haven't heard much of that today. So, uh, when we started the seasons, uh, DNR, with input from the stakeholders, uh, they wanted to put in an application fee. So it was 25,000 licenses. Uh, I think it was four dollars per fee. That all went into research. We wanted that to happen. It's going. We got licenses that are selling. For around thirty dollars, uh, we had uh, six thousand licenses purchased. Some under, some out of state. That's again added revenue. We've got a population out there. I think it's higher than what the DNR is saying, but we're going to go with that twenty to one hundred. That's pre-pup numbers. That's pre-pup. So if we got four hundred some packs in the Minnesota, I think we got a four point five uh, wolves per pack. You know that do the math comes up to five hundred. I heard some stuff here that. We lost 500 some wolves. Well, I went and did math in school, and if we took uh, 418 wolves in uh, 2012, and the USDA took out 200, do the math, it's going to be 700. So I think we're doing pretty good out there. Dave Meach, when he testified at the Senate hearing, he did a great job. That man is very smart. He said, "Move forward. The time is here." And I think right now, Dave Meach is going to say. You know, I think we're doing a good job. The DNR dropped back to 200 some permits in 2013. A lot of people told me, Dennis, what the heck's going on? We need to shoot more. No, we need to move cautiously. None of the hunters and trappers in northern Minnesota, where I come from, the northeast part, uh, want these exterminated. They're a beautiful animal, and I tell you, I'm um, the boots on the ground, and I see a lot of tracks, and I see a lot of wolves in my travels, and the numbers are okay. I think we just need to manage them. We got the Boys Fort Reservation just north of us. We've got sanctuaries, and I tell you, uh, we're going to do really good. So please, uh, let's keep the wolf hunt. We'll have the respect, and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, Lee. And if you could be down, uh, be down at the testifying stand, please. Uh, uh, Lee and uh, is it Denise uh, Keeney, and then uh, Mike Wagner. Welcome, sir. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair. Um, first, do you want the good news or the bad news? Well, we have to listen to it all, so give it your choice. All right. <laughs> good news is I just celebrated my 70th birthday. Well, that's good. The bad news is I just celebrated my 70th birthday. <laughs> and when I was sitting here thinking about this and listening to all those comments, I thought, you know, Along the way, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I've gotten any smarter, but I've sure have heard a lot of things. But I was thinking about the battles that I have heard along the way. And let's see, I figured it out about 40 years ago what we have been arguing about. Smoking. I don't know if any of you have ever ridden on a five-hour airplane ride in the old days when there was smoking in the cabin. You can't believe how, what that cabin was like. When my oldest was born, it was a two-bedroom, two the woman in the next bed was smoking. And both uh, recently had delivered. Uh, there was oxygen in use. I thought the whole wing of the hospital was going to go up. But we argued about that 40 years ago. Um, now it's taken for granted. I, I looked around, but I didn't see anybody smoking in here. But years ago, that would have been typical. Um, even farther back than that, um, <laughs> does anybody go up to Hawk Ridge in Duluth and see all the beautiful birds? And um, at uh, Hawk Ridge, everybody goes up to see all the birds. People come from all over the world, I guess, to see them. How did that get started? What was that used for before we counted birds. It was target practice. If you go back and look, that was what Hawk Ridge was for. Target practice, so we could all practice shooting birds. And that's what Hawk Ridge was. So when these things change, and these big ideas change, I was sitting here listening, and I had written down some clever remarks, but I'm just going to put those aside. 
Because I think we're missing, or not addressing the basic question. What's the basic question that we're all kind of thinking about? Recreational killing. That's the bottom line. When the gentleman said the pack can't stop killing, I had to stop and think for a second to see was he talking to wolves or was he talking to all of us? You know, that was the basic question. So recreational killing, that's really what this is all about. And we're going to have to make a decision as to um, how we're going to proceed. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, is it Denise? <clears throat> Denise, not here. Uh, Mike Wagner, please be down front. If, if your name is called, please be up at front. And we're going to have Nicole uh, Hendrickson next because that's taking up time to get people down here. And we might have some time for questions and answers here at the end. Then uh, uh, from the uh, Sandy Lake Band of Mississippi, uh, Chippewa Skinaway. Go ahead, sir. Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Mike Wagner. I'm a uh, volunteer for Howling for Wolves. Um, let's see, I think a lot of people have said already what they need to say about the issues, and I'll just be repeating them. Um, but I think, first of all, um, you know, for one, as far as the dressing of everyone um, that's in the activist movement is overly passionate. I think that's not such a bad thing because in order to have change, you have to be passionate to some sort of extent. The quote, you know, history made without, history is usually made by those who were the most passionate. You can see that with Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and others. Um, the wolf, as far as its place in the ecosystem, we've already covered that, but, you know, I wasn't born here, but, you know, I have family here, I moved back here recently, but before here I was living in Colorado, which has had its share of wolves and I laid there too, and I saw the evidence firsthand. I went to Rocky Mountain National Park where you saw an overpopulation of deer. And the effects were staggering because the vegetation was hugely annihilated. You had chronic wasting disease and constant delays of uh, reintroducing of deer or allowing them to come back, <laughs> thanks to delisting. But um, more importantly, I think we should be, I know everyone here has a vested interest in the wolf. I know everyone's trying to do what they think is right. But I think regardless whether we think they're ours or we are of them, we should be doing it for their own sake, not for us, and try to find a future for us all. So, Thank you. And Nicole. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nicole Hendrickson, and I live in Bemidji, Minnesota. I'm a tribal member of a uh, Sokogan Ojibwe community and also a citizen of Minnesota. Um, I have several problems with uh, the leg legislature's approach to managing wolves, um, and here's my fear. We have seen what happens when we leave um, wolf management up to hunters and cattlemen. Uh, in the early part of the century, they nearly decimated the entire species, uh, which resulted in the Endangered Species Act having to uh, um, initiate laws and control so that they would be preserved. Um, I, I want to know, are we really leaving are we really leaving the future of wolves up to hunters and trappers, which are the prime, which are the DNR's primary clients? Quite frankly, I'm um, disturbed by that comment, as I thought I was a primary client as a citizen of Minnesota. Um, I was appalled that in one hunting season, 25% of 
of species was annihilated in one season. My second point is that the voice of, our, of uh, the citizens of Minnesota has been undermined. Um, and this was done by sidestepping the wolf management plan and not initiating a five-year wait as you said you would do. Now this was done in um, consultation with, other, with, with the citizens of Minnesota and we, we held you to that. Another thing is um, consultation with tribes and as uh, Terry Tibbetts had clearly explained that that has not been done. Uh, additionally, numerous sources have indicated what the public attitudes are toward wolves. I've seen a 1999 study uh, commissioned by the um, Ely Wildlife or the Ely <coughs> Wolf Center, done by Dr. Kellert uh, from Harvard, who indicated that wolves have a that Minnesota residents find that wolves have that are valued for their non they have a they're valued for their non-consumptive, um, they have a non-consumptive value. Initially, the DNR had um, a poll that indicated that 79% of Minnesotans do not think there should be a wolf hunt. Nonetheless, they proceeded. If this is really about numbers getting out of control, I would like to see some statistical data that shows there's, their numbers are climbing exponentially. Um, so DNR, that's what I'm requesting. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Ms. Skinaway, <clears throat> you can testify from right there. Thank you. As my relations have said before me about the Brotherhood of Mayangan, also known as the Wolf, we consider Mayangan as family as well. And that, and that is why we all strongly oppose this wolf hunt. This perception of the wolf continues to exist today in our tribal heritage. We believe that our lives are parallel to one another, as the wolf and the Ojibwe people have suffered the same fates. History has proven that both Mayangan and the Ojibwe have lost their lands. We have both been persecuted and massacred, and we have both been hunted for our hair. It should, so, um, sorry. It should also be noted that both Mayangan and the Ojibwe also have a clan system and a tribe. Today, however, Mayangan is still being persecuted and massacred legally due to misinformation and just plain hatred. When the European settlers first settled in America, colonized it, they brought with them very bad negative views of the wolf. They saw the wolf as a vicious predator and vermin and the Ojibwe, on the other hand, had coexisted with the wolves for centuries because of the respect we have for all living beings. The negative view by the Europeans resulted in the eventual extermination of wolves from the lower 48 states. Now today, history is repeating itself once again. In Montana, close to 50% of the wolf population is gone. In Idaho, it's 80%. In Minnesota last year, 25% of the wolf population is gone, and who knows what percentage has declined from the last wolf eradication season of 2013 and 2014. In closing, I just want to say that wolves have as much right to exist and inhabit this land as we all do. They belong here, and they have a purpose. This is not an emotional issue for me. It's about my family and my heritage. Respect and coexistence is the key here. Miigwech, thank you. Okay, so Matt Johnson and then um, <clears throat> Mike Nemmers and then Stephen uh, Deerwolf Thompson and that'll be the last testifier. So if you can be up and ready to go, that would be helpful. <clears throat> Good evening everybody, my name is Matt Johnson. I'm from Minneapolis. I am an outdoors enthusiast, a lover of wildlife and nature, and a hiker, camper, that type of person. Um, I don't feel, I'm sorry, I don't feel confident in the DNR's ability to manage the wolf, despite the information they showed via slides and their testimony. Look at the moose. Populations dropping rapidly and possibly headed towards extinction in the state a species the DNR has been managing 
nearly exclusively for hunters. <coughs> and hunters love the moose, whereas most of them dislike the wolf. Now, I know some people up here uh, made the mistake of saying that the moose is being uh, killed by wolves, but I think most of us would agree the wolf and the moose lived here together for millennia before, and there's no problems there. Uh, the moose, like many other species around the world, is uh, it's it's clearly threatened by human pro uh, human caused problems, habitat loss, and uh, climate ch and climate change, just being a few of those. Uh, other examples, though, of animals that have gone extinct in Minnesota or nearly extinct are the Minnesota elk and the Minnesota bison. Based on testimony and leaked emails, which the DNR admitted tonight, or at least was brought up tonight by this uh, representative. The DNR has shown it believes it serves hunters, trappers, and farmers. They do not base their decisions on sound, on sound science or the preferences of the vast majority of Minnesotans that cherish animals as a beautiful and innately valuable portion of the world in Minnesota's habitat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mike Nemers. Thank you. I'm a Minnesota conservationist. Uh, assuming for the moment that the DNR's numbers for population estimates are accurate at 2,211, that being down from 3,000 in, in um, 2005, Minnesota DNR has had a successful management program and continued management is going to be required for the future. The wolf is a beautiful and crucial part of our ecosystem. And the recovery of the population should be lauded as one of the, age, as one of the great success stories in conservation. Uh, for a moment, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and give a wider perspective of, of populations, comparing Minnesota's wolf population to the Northwest Rockies. In 1987, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife set out a re wolf recovery plan to reestablish a sustainable population in the Northwest Rockies. This includes the area of western one-third of Washington, one th west, I'm sorry, eastern one-third of Washington, eastern one-third of Oregon, all of Idaho, the western one-half of Wyoming, and the western one-third of Montana the entire Northwest Rocky region. They trap wolves in Alberta, Canada with them in Yellowstone and they've expanded the range now. The entire Northwest Rocky of those five states encompasses 1,674 wolves where Minnesota estimates the population at 2,211. They have 321 packs in the Northwest Rockies. They have weekly reports, active hunting seasons of the sustainable populations in Idaho. No wolves are lost. They are sustainable populations. Their target recovery number was 1,000 wolves in the Northwest Rocky region, and that's much less than the current 1,674. Montana itself has wolves in the western one-third of the state, has a population of 625 wolves, comparing it again to 2,211 in Minnesota. This number is, even at this number, wolves are having a measurable impact on elk, moose, and deer populations, and the moose in the Yellowstone area are nearly gone. Minnesota's wolf density in the areas where they exist is approximately six times that of Montana's. Even at the original goal of 1251 to 1400 that Dan Stark mentioned, that's still 3.7 times the density of wolves in Montana. The impact of the wolf density can be seen in many ways, as others have mentioned, with the predation of moose in Minnesota. Minnesota moose mortality of the adult moose in the survey, the our reports and the graphs on their site show 50% were killed by wolves, either primarily or secondary by infection. The moose calves in the study, 70% of the calves in the study died. Of the ones that died, 70% of them were killed by wolves. The climate did not kill them. The ticks did not kill them. Those calves never saw their first frost. Um, looking at moose, the uh, moose population in Minnesota is down from about 8,600 moose in 2005 to 2,730 moose now. Wolf density in Minnesota should be reduced to a level similar to the wolf density in Montana. Uh, Maine is similar to the size of the moose range that Minnesota has. Maine has an approximately 76,000 moose. That's 214 moose per 100 square miles compared to 9.5 moose per 100 square miles in Minnesota. Maine harvested 2,937 moose in 2012. That's more than the entire population of moose estimated in Minnesota. Maine has no wolves to a measurable effect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Deerwolf Thompson. 
And we have one card that we didn't know we had, which was uh, Nancy Christopher. So if you can be ready, and that'll be the last one. Thank you very much. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Stephen DeWolf Thompson, and I'm here to represent the people of the Red Lake Reservation. I am from that reservation, and I also am representing the people from the Little Earth community in Minneapolis, the, um, all, all of whom oppose this hunt. The majority of what's been said here seems to be all about numbers. There's so many of this and so much of that, and we do this and that, but it's not about numbers, and it shouldn't be just about numbers. The DNR rushed into this hunt because they couldn't wait to start killing, even, and that's why they didn't do the studies that it took that would have provided the proper information. The um, idea that 185 female wolves were taken in this past hunt, and 30% of them were pregnant, I assume that means that they were apparently carrying uh, cubs. And if they, that means 62 of those wolves not only were killed themselves, but their cubs were killed. Those numbers aren't being included in what is being murdered here. The idea that wolves are uh, the reason for the moose decline is strictly speculation. There was a story on the news that the DNR thought this might be a reason, and there was never a follow-up story, story verifying that that was the case. It's, it's speculation, it's hype, and it's the reason a lot of people have come up here to talk, to try to talk about the reestablishment of the moose population. Now, the moose population is important, but it's not more important than the wolf. I don't know why the wolf is being put on the back burner in favor of all these other animals. Maybe because of the economic status. They make more money from killing moose than they do from killing wolves. But in the process, we need to stop this whole process before there becomes an economic tie to the killing of wolves that can't be reversed. There doesn't seem to be any concept of the fact that the wolf is the most human-friendly wild animal on the planet. That's why we all have dogs. And if you go out and shoot a wolf, you're essentially going out and shooting the dog in your backyard. I've heard two people so far tonight say they would like to get a permit to go and kill a wolf themselves. And I can only say shame on you. There is some kind of bloodlust factor that here that if a person will kill a wolf, he'll kill a human. And that is my view on this. I am a person who is a... Thank you. Time up? Yep. And then, um, thank you very much. Uh, Nancy, Christopher. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Yep. The last minute. Sorry we, had, we didn't have your card proper. But My name is Nancy Christopher. I live in Cologne, Minnesota. I also own property in Bemidji. I've spent uh, the last 30 years in the Bemidji area as well as Cass Lake. Um, I come from a family of ethical hunters. I'm the only girl in the family. Ethical hunting, ethical hunters do not have contempt for their prey. Yet the rhetoric surrounding the wolf hunt suggests strong contempt. Wolves are vermin. We need to kill them all. Only good, the only good wolf is a dead wolf. Poison them, my personal favorite. You take a sponge, you soak it in bacon grease, let it dry, stick it out in the woods, they'll eat it, it'll end up in their intestines, it'll swell up from the water and kill them. Um, don't kill the first one you see, just wound it, it'll still die, but you can still kill more this way. Um, this says wolves are dying at the hands of those who do not adhere to the standard, standards of ethical hunting practices. This says the 1930s are alive and well in Minnesota. Wolves may have recovered, but the, er the attitudes haven't. I can't think of another species that provokes such a strong emotional response and contempt as we see in everything, be it people, anything. Contempt always ends in abuse or encourages abuse. I own rim property and I actually had a wolf on my property in 2007. I couldn't believe it. 
I was just, I was thrilled. The next day I talked to one of my neighbors who knows about all this stuff, and I said, my God, I can't believe it. I thought, I think I had a wolf on my property. He says, you did. I know the guy who shot it. Shoot, shovel, and shut up is alive and well in the egg and farm and ranching areas of our state. The farmers don't even think twice about it. It's a threat. You pick up a gun, you shoot it. Be it a dog, a wolf, a coyote, it doesn't matter. We have truckloads of dead coyotes in Carver County, or we had. They, caught, they killed them all. <laughs> now we have no predators. What we have is we have an eruption of skunks <laughs> and other things. Geese, turkeys. Turkeys will be the next the geese. You know, we need predators to control populations. Um, the justification for the hunt was because the population had been established for the last 10 years and stable. Yet, now we are, just now we're losing deer and moose because of wolves? Nonsense. We know the reasons we're losing deer. We know the reasons for the reduction in the moose populations. Moose don't make, or er, wolves do not make adult moose sick. And they're dying of sickness. Uh, lastly, um, th th nothing's been said as far as how they justify or how they determine whether something is an actual wolf kill, actual depredation. Uh, there is a study in 1970. It had to do with the, wolf, the farmer sent the cows out in the woods in the winter, and when they came back in the spring, if they didn't have as many as they thought they should have or as many calves, they assumed wolves killed them, and they turned it in and got money. Thank you. I can provide that study if you'd like. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Yep. Okay, Dr. David Trevers, is he still here? Yes. Could you come forward? Did he leave? It's uh, Adrian Trevis. Oh, Trevis, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for coming back. Uh, one of our members of Rip Cornish, you had a question? Thank you. Oh, not for this person here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I thought sorry. you had a question for him. Okay, does anyone have any questions? We have about nine minutes left. Does but anyone have any? I'm sorry. For? It was more. I could ask this guy because I think he's one of the. Could you come up to the? You yep. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> I'm sorry. It you was, guys I, do this to everybody from Wisconsin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you support Green Bay. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, Representative Dill or Chairman Dill. I was. There was a couple of people that used this fact, and I just. It was more of a clarification than the question. The fact has been thrown out tonight that there is 65 confirmed livestock kills. That's a totally bogus statistic because that's just confirmed kills. What it actually is, there was one farmer that I didn't claim that claimed that he had lost 20 calves when the, when the cows came back in between the artificial insemination pregnancy checking and this and that over his records. And there were so many times that I went out where uh, the calves were just plain missing. And the problem is when they're taken in the pasture and they don't leave any scat or any tracks and you don't have any method of kill, you can't claim them. And so this could be three times this amount that the, the amount of sheep and calves uh, that are taken. And so if anybody of the advocacy groups use that figure, keep in mind that it could be triple or quadruple that amount uh, because there's so many missing ones that we couldn't find carcasses. So Do, that, that was more of a clarification than a question. Does anyone have a question since we have a fine doctor up here in his expertise in area? Uh, that's not what we had planned, but since you're there, if anyone had a question. <laughs> So you're, I'm sorry, you're not a member of the of panel. Anyone else? Uh, Representative Hanson. I had a question, and I, I don't know if there's, uh, we had, the uh, Deer Hunters Association had a letter in here, and I think, I don't know if Moha is still here, but I think we had testimony that the deer license pays for part of the depredation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm not, I'd, I'd like some commentary if that's, Right, that the deer license pays for the depredation for wolves. Why would the deer hunters do that? And if we've moved to wolves as a game species, if that if people want to hunt wolves, why wouldn't the wolf hunters pay for the depredation? If this is a game species that we're managing for game, rather than for removal. If we're managing for game, then should that cost cover the depredation cost rather than having the deer hunters pay the depredation cost or the general taxpayer pay the depredation cost. So I don't know if any of the people have testified, but I think 
we heard that that the deer hunters are paying for the depredation cost or part of it. So, uh, Representative Hanson, that's a that's a very good question. The finance chair is sitting next to you, and the former finance chair isn't here. Uh, at least it's on this committee. So, what we will do is we will get the committee will receive an informational sheet on exactly who's paying for what uh, from the department, and that's an official request of the committee. Representative Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just have a question. Um, can you just, in your opinion, tell me uh, how does the hunt either um, help or hurt depredation purposes? Uh, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Representative. Um, the entire United States needs a very good study of how regulated harvest affects depredation by predators. We do not have any experimental studies of that question. The, the United Kingdom is ahead of us on this one because they did it with badgers and bovine tuberculosis control. All right, so the strict scientific answer is we don't know. However, there's a study, and uh, Minnesota is a leader, um, a study by Elizabeth Harper, who I, I mentioned earlier, works for the DNR in Minnesota. She's the lead author. David Meach and others are co-authors. That is probably the best look at correlations, what happens after trapping. Okay, so it's not about regulated harvest. It's about lethal control by trappers, by USDA Wildlife Services trappers. It's probably the best study out there, however, doesn't have very strong conclusive results about the effect of lethal control, and I personally would like to revisit it because the methods are a little bit odd. So the take home message is we don't know what a regulated harvest does about two depredations. As a scientific community, we don't know. There's a lot of opinions out there, but not good systematic scientific data that, that I think needs to be collected. All right, thank you very much. All right, so um, I also wanted to read into the record that we had received written testimony over and above the people who had uh, uh, testified here this evening from uh, Willard, and it's spelled S-H-A-P-I-R-A -A of Roseville, the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association, uh, Catherine Zimmer of St. Paul, uh, Lynn Griffith of Brimson, a constituent of mine, uh, Minnesota Forest Trappers Association, uh, the Minnesota Farmers Union, uh, Margaret Naylor, Mike Ruzich. Those are all of the written testimony that we've received, and we'll keep a record of that so anyone in the committee that wants that or other people can uh, request it of Mr. Strohmeyer. Then I'd like to thank our pages tonight for their work and our staff for staying here late. I appreciate the, uh, the uh, fact that this was a good orderly discussion, and uh, with that, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>